preface the publication of this text is a first for two reasons. It is the first time a text from the BB apostrophe NPO tradition has been published in its entirety, demonstrating the vitality and importance of this tradition which has survived intact from very ancient times. Secondly it is the first time a complete text concerning DZOGCHEN has been made available to a general western audience, and gains from the fact that it was actually written in modern times, almost certainly after 1930. Written by Charles Atashi Oyeltsin, 1859-1935, a famous Sponpo master who gave teachings to students of other schools of Tibetan Bud, Ism as well as to many students from the Bonpo community, it belongs within an unbroken lineage that remains active right up to the present day. Reappraisal of the Bonpo and their role in the development of Tibetan culture has been a feature of Western scholarship of the last 20 years, and we hope that this volume will help in this task. Toward this end we have included with the text a short history of Yundran, Atur, Nol, Ben from their own perspective, as well as biographies of Sharps Atashi Oilson and Lepmantenim Nemdag, the Bonpur master responsible for this translation. It is important to note here that the Lepan recognizes three distinct types of Ben the old Ben, which is entirely shamanistic, the new or reformed Ben, which arose in response to competition from other Buddhist schools and the Yundring or Eternal Ben, which is the Tredi, Tiwan presented here. Yundring Ben shares many imi, larities with the other traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, but traces its origin to a much earlier teacher than Shek, Yemeni Buddha, namely Tonpak Buddha, Shehimru, who taught in a country to the west of Tibet. The tradition then spread to the western regions of the Tibetan Plower, Teo, most notably to the kingdom of Zhangzhou in the Kailash region, and was already ancient when King Songtsen Gangpo, Shrengbi Rstansgampo, conquered the kingdom in the 7th century. When dealing with an ancient history that tells a story significantly different from the Buddhist histories of Tibet, one struggles to find pointers that can help either validate or at least locate some of the events within a western conception of cultural progression. In particular, the idea that the culture of Yundrang Ben Ergi netted in the region of Persia, and that many of the teachings originated from the west of the Tibetan Plower, Tero instead of from the Indian subcontinent, and did so in a period that predated the time of the historical Buddha, seems almost incredible to those used to the received history of the conversion of Tibet in the time of the kings of the 7th century. Indeed, due to the periodic upheavals that have occurred in the region and the fragility of the paper on which the texts were written, any attempt independently to assess this history is made immeasurably more difficult by the rarity of ancient texts that can be dated in their original form. Furthermore, in the case of the Bonpo, the early lineage was entirely transmitted orally so it would appear that no direct records remain to give an insight into the early history. There are two exceptions to this conclusion, however. The first concerns important elements of an in Tibetan culture, including both architecture as well as religious concepts, that have been noted by scholars as bare in comparison with ancient Persian culture once since these elements date from the period when the Ben religion was preeminent in Tibet, they lend credence to the idea that Persian influences were important in ancient times. The line of evidence is more direct as regards the style and origin of the Bonpur Chalkton monuments. Here, as in many other elements of Bonpo culture, it has been claimed that the Bonpo copied the Buddhist stupa style in an attempt to compete with Buddhist culture even though there are important differences between them. Most notable are the Bonpo texts indicating temple enclosures within the structure of Jordan, which in consequence are often drawn with a box like lower stolo, right beneath the recognizable stupa structure above. An other important difference is the use of a trident with the central flaming sword as the symbol on top of the struck chi, instead of the sun and crescent moon used in the Buddhist style. Recently two studies have been published concern in the images depicted in ancient rock carvings in the Karakoram and in Ledak to the west of Tibet. These carvings are of particular interest as they can be dated C. Jerusiptai, the religions of Tibet, London. Route, Bajan Keegan Paul, 1980, Concerning the Origins of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. H. Richardson and D. Snell, Grove, A Cultural History of Tibet, Boston. Shambhala, 1986, Concerning Architecture. And Jayakamal Orofino, Sacred Tibetan Teachings on Death and Liberation, Bridport. Prison Press, 1990, concerning the similarities between Tibetan and Zoroastrian dualism. Concerning the Karakoram carvings, see Karl Jegma, b, between the Gahandra and the Silk Road. 
the rock carvings of the Karakoram Highway, Mainz. Velik Philipp von Zeben, 1987, Illustration No. 14, or Antiquities of Northern Pakistan, edited by Karl Jegmer, Mainz. Velik Philipp von Zeben, 1989, Volume I, Plates 5 to 6. Regarding the lead hip carvings, see Jayakamala Orofino in East and West 1991. By other means and so provide direct chronological evi, dense about the early period of Tibetan culture. It is therefore of some importance that one such carving from the Karakoram dated as 1st century CE clearly shows the characteristic style of a Bonpur stupa with the open, in in the base and the trident symbol, as well as the swastika symbol of Yundrang Ben. Such evidence must make one wonder about the confident assertions that such a style was copied from the Indian Buddhist culture that did not arrive in Tibet until six centuries later. The lead hip carvings act to this picture, for although they were made by soldiers at the time of the expansion of Tibetan influence that coincided with the arrival of Buddhism from India, they all used the Bonpur stupa style along with inscriptions in the archaic language of Western Tibet, Zanjung, that was supplanted by Tibetan. Again, the generally accepted idea that written language arrived in Tibet with Buddhism from India seems less credible in light of these findings. The translation of the text the text presented here is in the style of personal instruction from Shahza to his students. Such texts are called Mangajdama and Mgagsde, in the tradition of DZ G Chen, and this text is a condensé of a two-volume work by Shahza in the same style. The translation was carried out in the month of August 1991 by Lepentenium Nedek in the course of teaching the text to a small group of Western students in his monastery in the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal. As the rain fell around us, Lepin spent some two hours every morning translating and teaching from the text, which was typed on a portable work processor as he taught it. It was also tape recorded, which enabled us to check that the typed text was accurate, and that no unwa, random omissions occurred from the Tibetan original. The typing and the correcting of the English was done by me, whilst the checking of the typescript against both the tape and the original text was carried out by Monica Gentile, who is completing her thesis on aspects of Tibetan culture at the Sanskrit University of Benares, India. The final version was then read back to the Lepin, who checked it for a second time against the Tibetan original. Apart from the omission of some quotations in early sections, this process was applied to all sections of Sharpe's original, and the appendices that accompany it. Thanks here are also due to Kehihe, who helped translate the Bilgra, Fee of Sharpe's Atashi Oyeltsin, and Tabchu Skorupska, who translated the short history of Ben that forms Eb, Endix II. As well as being an acknowledged master of DZ Doji, Chen, Lepentenium Nemdug is a remarkable teacher with an encyclopedic knowledge of Bonpur culture and a lifetime's experience of teaching it to trainee monks, both in Tibet and India. Not only could he translate the text as he read it to us, but he was happy to answer any points of clarification or problems of interpretation as they arose during our sessions, and his answers form almost another Mengajda text alongside the original. These comments are to be found in the copious foot, notes that accompany the text, and should be read as a commentary to it, at the same time. Reading it now in London, there are many other questions I would like to have asked him, but hope that many questions will be answered by presenting the text in this way. Following the suggestion of Per Kvaerne, who very kindly offered to write an introduction to the text as well as check my English for inconsistencies, this text is better described as an exegetical commentary than as a strict translation. As it is a commentary of what is, after all, a personal instruction by a great master of DZ Dogchem, this need not cause too much of a problem, and we hope it preserves some of the flavor of the text as it was taught. For those new to DZ Dogchem, however, a comprehensive resume of background reading is given by Pro. Professor K V A E R N E in the bibliographic essay that follows the text. The final point concerns the vexed question of how to present Tibetan terms in English, and we decided to use spellings that enable a rough enunciation of the Tibetan original, followed by the more precise oily transliteration in brackets afterward, so that the ease of reading the text would not be interrupted. As mentioned in the first line of this preface, this is indeed a rare event, and we hope that this wonderfully clear and concise text will be both comprehensible and useful to whoever reads it. It describes a tradition that is utterly extraordinary in the truest sense of that overused word, yet is still active and available. May it serve to benefit beings. 
Richard Ditsa, London, October 1991 Introduction It is still not widely known that Buddhism is not the only religion in Tibet. Buddhism, introduced in the 7th century CE under the patronage of powerful Tibetan kings, became the dominant religious faith in the 11th century, and has remained so until today. Nevertheless, alongside Buddhism a second religion has survived down through the centuries. This religion, for which there is no other term than its Tibetan Desertna, Tiranophon, claims to be the very same religion that had long been established in Tibet when Buddhism entered the scene. Ben, so its adherents claim, has a proud and ancient history long and dating the origins of Buddhism in India. This claim has generally been dismissed by Western scholars who have stressed the innumerable points of similarity in fact, often identity between Ben and Buddhism, and thus concluded that Ben is, essentially, nothing more than a highly heterodox form of Buddhism. There is, however, a growing feeling among some scholars that the claim of Ben to be a separate religious tradition with an identity of its own has to be taken seriously. Nor should it be forgotten that Tibetan Buddhists, too, have on the whole regarded BBN as an ong, entirely distinct, non-Buddhist religion. This does not mean that the Bon perversion of history necessarily has to be accepted at face value, at least as far as the period preceding the 7th century is concerned. It does mean, however, that if, instead of focusing on monastic life and metaphysical doctrine, where the merging with Buddhism often appears to be complete, one looks at the sources of religious authority and legitimation, the distinctiveness of Ben, as understood by most Tibetans, becomes immediately apparent. The Bonposas op opposed to Buddhists do not derive religious legitimation from the Buddhist ecumeny, but from an enlight, end being, Ton Pa Shehenrib stored Pa Rab, the teacher of Shehenrib. Long before Shehkirmani, Ton Pa Shehenrib lived as a prince, and later as king, of Omo Lungring, a land situated, so the Bonpos assert, to the west of Tibet. Omo Lungring is often identified with Tezib, generally held by Tibetans to be the Iranian or Persian world. Furthermore, the doctrine which Ton Pa Shehenrib preached, that is, Ben, is believed to have come to Tibet not from India as Buddhism did, but rather from a land the historical existence of which, though little else, is fully attested, namely Zhangjung, located in what today is, in a broad sense, western and northern Tibet. The Ben religion is alive and indeed to some extent even flourishing today not only in Tibet itself, where, especially in the east, Kem, and northeast, Amda, entire districts still firmly adhere to Ben, but also in Nepal, Dola and Albria, and in the Tibetan exile communities in India. Both in Tibet and in exile there are several erudite and spiritually highly accomplished Bonpulamas, one of the most venerated of whom is Lepen Slop Dpoen, head teacher, Tenim Namdik. For an increasing number of Tibetan and Western disciples and friends, his learning and warm, compassionate presence have been a profoundly moving experience. The present text should be seen as the fruit of an encounter between a highly qualified Tibetan Bonpulama, willing and indeed eager to share his vast store of knowledge, and a Western pupil equally eager to learn and communicate to others what has been learned. As a document resulting from such an interaction the text will repay study. It gives an indication, a kind of rough hint, of the spiritual treasures to be found in the Ben religion. At the same time, it is essential to realize what this text is not. It is not a real translation. The careful work of interpretation and collation, based on a close and competent study of a large number of texts in the original Tibetan remains to be done, and it is this alone which may, at some future time, make accurate and adequate translations possible. The reader is well at, viz to have no illusions about this. Even less should the text be taken to be a do-it-yourself manual for those who aspire actually to practice the spiritual discipline, to attain the great perfection described therein. For such prac, tice the personal, regular guidance of a qualified, exp, real lama is absolutely indispensable. Those wish, into experiment on their own, may be assured that whatever mental experiences they may have will be either delusive, or the danger is a real one destructive. The Great Perfection, is regarded by Bonpos as the highest, the ultimate religious practice. It has been preserved in several distinct traditions. Also, the Nyingmapa school of Buddhism has a Dzedogchen tradition, which it claims goes back to the great Siddhapadmasampavai, 8th century CE, and his disciples. 
A comparative study of the Bonpuan and Yingmapa varieties of Dze Do Gchen remains to be undertaken. Nevertheless, in recent years a fairly lively interest in Dze Do Gchen has been evident both among a number of scholars and among the more numerous Western adepts. The bibliographic essay yep, appended to the text is not complete but should be useful to those who want to find further information and perhaps return to the present text with a better understanding of its subject matter. Per KVAER in a University of Oslo Shards Attached Oilson Biography of Shards Attached Oilson in general, there are three sections to a master's bigra, fee. The external, which is also that general biography, the internal and the esoteric biography. Here, only the general biography is described, but in it there are some parts which concern a specific internal and esoteric aspects as well. There are eight subdivisions of the external bigra, fee. His birth, how he began learning the religious path, how he began thinking and practicing according to the path of Yundrung Ben, how he received teachings, initiations, and vows, how he practiced in solitude, how he worked for the doctrines of Tom Passion, Rab, and for the benefit of all beings, the teachings and works he left behind, how he manifested his great knowledge, Azar in both body, his birth, when Shards Atashi Oyeltsin, Sharadi Zade Bkra Shizarji was born. There were many auspicious signs. In the sky there were many rainbows, and there was a shower of flowers. The country in which he was born is in the Khem region of East Tibet. It is a place in B, between two rivers, the Dzedeshu Dzedeshu, and the Ngulshu, Dngulshu, and is called Dagang, or the range of Dagang, Zla Gang. This is a place where many saints have previously been born, or have stayed and visited. It is known, in short, as Dzedekog, or Dzedekog. The name of the village in which Shaza was born is Dara, Brda, in the foothills of that place. His father belonged to the clan of Hoya, Hoya, and was called Tashie, Bkrashisdga apostrophe, and his mother was called Bolek, Bolex. He was born on the eighth day of the third month of the Earth Sheep Year, 1859. From his childhood, he did not give his parents much trouble and was easy to raise. Even from his infancy, he always had good manners and behaved with calm and composure. He also showed the auspicious signs of teach, in other children, building stupas and chanting, and in this way pretended to be the teacher. Sometimes he also saw forms of divinities in space. When he was nine years old, a great siddha called Tenin Wangyal, B-S-T-A-N-D-Z-I-N-D-B-A-N-G-R-G-Y-A-L, whose secret name was Drenpa Dudl, Drenpa B-D-U-D Dudl, told his parents, your son must become a monk. But the pa ends refused because Shadza was their only son. Soon after, Shadza developed some mental sickness, and for many days neither ate nor slept. So the parents took him to Tenin Wangyal, who again said, this child is connected to the religious way of life. You should send him on the religious path, otherwise he will not be useful for you. This time, the parents understood and decided to let the child become a monk. When they returned home, the child's mental sickness gradually lifted, and he was finally released from it. How he began learning the religious path Tenin Wangya recognized that the boy had a very long last in connection with him over many past lives. So he was very kind to this boy from the beginning and the boy was always very devoted to him. When the child was born, he had blessed him with long life. After the boy became older, he took the refuse vow from Tenin Wang Yao, who prayed that the boy would become Ben, official to all sentient beings. Thus he gave the boy the name Tashi Oilson. He also made a special prayer to the Red Yamo, Zripa Gyalmo, to bless the boy. When the boy was twelve, he went to his uncle Yoon, Drung Oilson Moon Drung R-G-Y-A-L-M-S-T-H-A-N, to learn how to read and write. Soon after, the boy received many initiations, teachings and transmissions from the special master Tenin Wangyal. Tenin Wangyal knew that the boy would be Impa, tanned for Tom Pasha Hinrub's teachings and for the benefit of all sentient beings, so he advised the boy to take the Vini vows, the Tantric vows and the Dze Do Gchen vows. He also told the boy to practice and meditate diligently, learning Sutra, Tantra and Dze Do Gchen. One day, Tenin Wangyal put a huge volume of books on the boy's head and prayed for a long time and said, You will be the owner of this doctrine. From that moment, Shadzi had a great change of feeling, and this was the beginning of his receiving auspicious signs.
This was the beginning of the mental initiation and blessing that Shaja was to receive from Tenim Wangyal. The boy now became very sharp and intelligent, had great devotion, stopped all desires for the worldly life, and naturally increased his compassion and devotion to both the doctrines and his masters, particularly to Tenin Wang Yao, who transferred his mental blessing to him. One springtime there was a drought, and the local people asked Tenin Wang Yao to call for rain. Tenin Wang Yao took the boy with him as assistant. He gave the boy a sword and asked him to push down the wind. Shadza held on to the sword, and after some time the master returned suddenly, took the sword forcefully away from the boy, and showed the face of anger. He used the sword to hit the boy, who fell unconscious. After a while, the boy woke up, and at that moment he received the hard transmission from his master and realized the natural state clearly, on the same level as his master. From then on whatever he studied, it was as easy for him as if he had known it before, and he meditated with the recognition of this natural state day and night. He was never again in any doubt, and was never in fear of not having the knowledge of the natural state. He also started learning grammar and poetry. From then on he began keeping notes for his books called The Five Treasures, a collection of thirteen volumes of his writings. Besides, his meditation was very stable and developed without his having to practice as hard as other people. He also had special knowledge of the nine ways of Ben. Yet, he behaved in the same way as an ordinary young boy. How he received teachings, initiations and vows when he was young, he kept the Vard refuge and other simple vows very strictly. Everyone praised his man, ne'er of keeping the vows. When he was older, the abbot of Yundrang Lin, Yundrang slash in, whose name was Kel, Zain Nimato Gai Oyeltsen, Saw Bzdangyi Matogyi Yalmtshan, came to Kem. He was invited to Dzd Tenchen Genpa, Rdzd Stench Ndgo Npa, the boy's monastery. There, many people took their vows from this abbot, and each received a name at the same time. When it came to Shadza, he received the name Ten Padrarak Bstan Padrak Grax, from the abbot, who repeated the name three times. All those who were taking the vows burst out laughing loudly. The abbot said that it was a very auspicious sign, and that the boy would become a great man. The reincarnation of Tzik Tzik, whose name is Shnyal Tenin, Gshenrgyalbstandzdian, came to the Dzdkogrdzd Kohog, country upon the invitation of Shah, Dzd's monastery. He was the holder of the Vimni of vows of the Mnres Manri lineage. In front of the abbot, the Lebenslop Dpori, or teacher, a witness, and an inter, Pritter, all four of whom were high monks, Shadza took the highest and final Vimni of vows. He kept his original name, Tenpadrarag, and additionally received the name Drimniang Podrimetsniangpo. From that time onward, he never took any alcohol, never ate meat nor wore the skin of animals, and he conducted himself completely according to the Vinaya rules. Altogether he observed 250 vows. The second vow is the Vav Buddhisattva, which he took from Semtnyesh Bsamgta and Yishas. At the same time, he received the name Yelzhimpan Norba Gylsrsgzdhan Phan Nord. He practiced the two kinds of Buddhisattva. One that is according to the absolute truth, and the other according to the relative truth. When he took the vows, he offered hundreds and thousands of butter lamps, flowers, incense and tema, ritual cakes. From then on, he always kept the vows precisely and paid attention to all details. In the tradition, different texts mention different vows as part of the Buddhasatta vow. Some mention 20 vows, some mention an extended form of 360 vows, some mention a medium form of 108 vows and some 28 vows. These vows can be described as the four kinds of Buddhasatta vows, all of which Shatta practiced. In addition, he also practiced the ten perfections. The presence of an interpreter is to ensure that the vow explained to the person taking the vow is clearly understood. The recipient thus cannot claim at a later date that the meaning of the vow was not explained clearly. The Tantric vow Shadza took the Tantric vows from his rude master, Tenim Wangyal. He took the initiation of the Yudam called Welsen Gampa, Dbalgsasr and Gampa. At the time of the initiation, he was introduced to the nature of mind, the four initiations of the Yudam and the initiation of Dzdogchen called Oil Tap Chilgar Gyal Has Bialux. 
from another master called Ridin Sawandrakpa, Rid Dzadintsheedvang Braxpa, who was also known as Dechen Lingpak Bde Chen Lingpak. He received the initiation of the peaceful and the wrathful form of the same Lidam, while sent Gampa. Also he received the Dzado Gchen initiation of Rid Patselwam, Rid Patsaldvang, as well as the preliminary and essential teachings of Atria, Akhrid besides many other tantric initiations. In the tantric vow, there are five root vows and twenty, five branch vows for the Kerim, BSKYED ring, and five root vows and one hundred branch vows for the DZDOGRIM, RDZDOGSRIM. In DZDOGCHEM, there are thirty vows. Shards had kept all these vows carefully and clearly. In the Bonpur tradition, all the vows mentioned above are those that can be taken by a person who can take all three types of vows, which he did. Altogether Shadza had 24 teachers, from whom he learned different subjects. Usually in those days people were satisfied after learning from one or two masters. But Shadza was special. He continued to seek and learn all the time. To the following masters he offered all his wealth and from them he received all the teachings of different subjects, initiations and transmission, sense. DZATRUL TENIN WANGYAL, DZD SPRULT and DZINDBANGRGYAL, DEPCHEN LINGPA, BDE CHEN GLINGPA, DUDEL LINGPA, BDU DULJ LINGPA, SEMT MYESH, BSAMGTAN YESHES, SHNYAL TENIN, GSHENRGYAL BSTAN DZIN, Sewang in TSHEDVANG ERIMD, RING CHEN ENGEL RING CHEN MAMAR GYAL, KULZAM NIMAT BSKAL BZAN GNIMAR, METON NIMAR OIL SUM MISTEN NIMAR GYAL IN TSHARI, PATWAN NIMAT BUMZAL SPA STEN NIMAR BUM GSAL, UNDRAN WANG YAL, UNDRAN DBAN GR GYAL, SULTRIM NEMD TSHUL KHRIMS MANDEK BS ON EMS R GYAL IN TSHARI, Sultrim Pulsang TSHULKHRIMSDPLBZANG, Sonim Pulsang BSON MSDPLBZANG, Nima Ezanima Wadza, Tokting Gedati OGSIDANDGA apostrophe BDE, Yeshtenim Yeshaz BSTANDZIN, Lamat Nyabla Mar BSTANRGYAL, Yezin Wang Yalit BZHIMDBANGRGYAL, Sam Gakling Pak GSANGSNGAGS Kling Pak Chim Tusk Pukines Fud, Nima Zain Panima BZANGPO, Doidrak Pazay Delay Bagraxbd, how he practiced in solitude when Shahza was about 34 years old, one day he felt great disgust for living in this worldly life. So he decided to go stay in solitude completely. The place he went to stay was Yundrang LHUNPO Yundrang in Po, which bordered Shahza, his country. When he went there, many auspicious signs appeared, so he decided that it was a suitable place. There he built a small hut, just big enough for him to sit inside. At this place, he completely stopped all external and worldly activities and connections, and internally his mind stopped thinking of plans and desires, including relatives, friends and wealth. Living in solitude, he only had simple food and one set of clothes. In this way he practiced with a rested body, speech and mind. He started, as was done normally, by doing the preliminary practice of the teaching. He also did the refuge, buddhasatta and the esoteric practices. At that time, Pia, Pel generally learned and practiced the Bonpur teaching only for food and wealth. Those people considered it sufficient just to do some rituals and prayers to please those who demanded it. However, Shadza saw all the essential points of the Bonpur teachings and practiced accordingly, without paying any attention to such worldly thoughts. In his own country, the tradition of the teaching was mixed up with the new Ben. He was able to see clearly the historical and pure part of the old Ben teachings, and completely left out the new Ben teaching, keeping strictly to the old Yundrun tradition. In Bonpur there are five high clans or families of people, which have the Durabur, Zhou, Z slash I, Pa, Spa, Mi, RME, and Shen, GSHEN, clans. Each one has its own line, age tradition and strict rules, even though they're all Bonpos. He respected all these traditions, but he fell, load the Dura tradition, because this is the lineage holder of Minre. From the beginning he practiced the relative Buddhasitta and the absolute Buddhasitta. He practiced with great hardship in solitude. 
He also practiced the Kerim and Dize Doji Rim of various Yidams in the Tantric teachings. He divided the 24 hours of a day into four sessions, and practiced most of the Yidams, particularly peaceful Kunz and Kumbi Zedang, Drenpan Mka, Slash Renpan Mmkha, and Tsewam, Tshedbang, or Black Killer. He practiced everything, including Tamo, Dize Doji Rim and Mantra. Even though he mainly practiced the recitation of mantra, he especially did the practice of trecho, khreg ked, and togal, thedrigal, all the time. How he worked for the doctrines of Tom Pashahinrab and for the benefit of all beings he worked for the preliminary teachings and the history of Sutra, Tantra and Dize Doji Chen. Hence, he compiled them into two volumes. His commentaries on the Nine Ways of Ben and on Trecho and Togel of Dize Doji Chen in particular were compiled into two volumes. He held the lineage of Zngjun Nainu, Zngjun Zngjun Brgyud, teachings. He also wrote many ritual texts for prayers and Ganapuja, as well as kept teachings, Sutra and Tantra teachings with various subjects in the Sutra and their commentaries. All his work is like the lamp for the old Ben tradition. Later in our time, when people eagerly want to know something about Ben, his works are like a key to the whole tradition. He had many disciples following his teaching. Among them, the best disciple was called Tesson Sangakling Paji Terchengsangsngagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgagsgags
He also said to his disciples, I, the old man Shadzapa, don't know when I am to pass away. I have been teaching specifically for the past eight years and I have taught many important teachings and I hope that you are not going to waste them. I advise you not to waste any of these teachings you have received but continue to practice until you are stable in your natural state. I think you are all very lucky, B, cause it is very rare to receive these teachings. Since you have received them, you must try to realize yourself. They are very precious, can you understand? When he was 76, in the wood dog year, one of his disciples, Kulzan Yundran, B.S.K.A.L.B.Z.A.N.G.U.N. slash run, was praying and practicing in order to bless some medicine. Shadza told this disciple to finish his prayers before the fourth month, because after that they would not meet again. Then on the second day of the fourth month Shadza was presented with the blessed medicine with the prayer complete. He said, now I have to go to the empty places. So he went to the place called Rabziten, Rabziten, to stay. He put up a small tent there. Several of his students followed him and he told them, the base of all knowledge is faith, devotion and vow. So you must realize this and carefully practice. In addition, he also gave them much advice. Very often his gazes were straight into space. On the thirteenth day of the fourth month, he made a Ganapuja offering of Tselwang Bo Yulamati S-H-E-D-B-A-N-G-B-O-D Yulama, and he sang many teachings in the form of songs. He then ordered his disciples to sew the tent completely closed, and not to open it for many days. Then he went into the tent and said good luck to his students, as well as prayers. Then he sat inside in the posture with five characteristics. On the next day, his students saw many rainbows above his tent. Some were big, some were small, some were round, others were straight, horizontal or vertical, all with many colors. Particularly at night white lights like long white scars shone forth brilliantly, which everyone saw. On the fourth day, there was an earthquake, and there were loud and strange sounds. Also showers of flowers rained down. Between the stitches of the tent many lights with different colors some with five colors, some with only a single color came out like steam. His student called Sultri Wangcha, T-S-H-U-L-K-H-R-I-M-S-D-B-A-N-G-P-H-Y-U-G, said, if we leave the body for much longer, everything will disappear and there will be nothing left from the corpse. We should have something as relics for our devotion. So he opened the tent, and prostrated. The body of Shadza was completely wrapped up with light, and the size had shrunk to that of a one-year-old boy. It was suspended above the mattress at a height equal to the distance between the outstretched fingertip and the elbow of an arm. He went into the tent, and saw the fingernails had come out of the fingers and were scattered on the mattress. When he touched the body, the heart was still warm. He wrapped up the body with a cloth and kept it for 49 days. He then did a puja of the 1000 names of the Buddhas, as well as many Gana puja and other offerings. After, when visitors saw the body and touched it, everyone had many special feel, ings rising in themselves. All the people saw lights, rainbows and rains of flowers every day. All the local people visited the body and strong devotion arose in all of them and they had great belief in him. Some of the non-devotees were saying that, the Lama was not so special when he was alive, but is more special dead. So he is better dead than alive. His successor, Letro Yetsa, Biogros Rgyamtsho, and his younger brother, Tsultrim Tenin, Tsulkhrimsbstandzin, saw to it that all his properties were given as offerings and donations to all monasteries, both Bud, Ist and Bunpo, particularly to his own monastery, Dzday Tenchen Genpa. They also asked the monasteries to do prayers for many weeks, and gave them properties so that every year they would recite prayers on the Ani, Rosary of the manifestation of his rainbow body the thirteenth day of the fourth month. They also made a large memorial stupa, with gilded copper, and his body was put inside in the niche of the ball of the stupa. Even much later people still could see the reflection of lights and rainbows and sparks coming from it. Extracted and translated by Lepantenim Nedic from the biographical account by Sugila Kulzan Tenpei Oyeltsen, Sula B.S.K.A.L.B.Z.A.N.G.B.S.T.A.N.P.R.G.Y.A.L.M.T.S.H.A.N. 1897 Hard drops of Dahamikai introduction in his text. There are three subdivisions according to whether the student is clever, medium or not bright. By following these practices, 
the first will achieve Buddhahood in one lifetime, the second in the intermediate state and the third after several lives of using the Dze Doji Chen methods. These subdivisions occur in every section of the text and do not refer to the four major books into which it has been divided. Yoli Yom Shverup Jama Book 1 Preliminary Practices Tibetan Text 3 a, Line 2 First there is a preliminary practice which is described in two sections. The purpose of the first practice is to distinguish between samsara and nirvana. The purpose of the second is to stop desire for body, speech and mind. The first preliminary practice cycle. To distinguish samsara from nirvana the first practice is further subdivided into external and internal practices. External practice, go to a quiet place without any people and stay there. First make offerings to the mountain gods or whoever is powerful and spiritual in the area so that they are not disturbed. Tell them where you are practicing so that you do not disturb them. Then, thinking that you must stop desire for samsara, ask what is the purpose of so much attachment? You need to ask why you have this desire. Imagine that you are naked and born in hell, screaming and suffering as, if you are actually there. Then imagine that you were born in the realm of the hungry ghosts, pitas, with endless hunger and want. Imagine you are born in the animal realm, doing as animals do. Then think that you were born as a human with servants, imagine that life. Then as a titan, Zera, fighting with another, what is the purpose of that? Finally imagine that you were born as a god, ever, and spending life in leisure without thinking of the next life, what is the purpose of this? Imagine that you are circulating from one realm to the next. Do whatever comes to your mind and vision or imagination. Then imagine what it is like to be a Yidam, tutelary deity, or that you are in Shambhala and are teaching the Bhuhisattvas, or in the Tantric realms with the Siddhas of disciples, or in Sukhavati or Omo Lundgring teaching Dze Doji, Pachanpa. Pretend that you are actually doing this. Finally dissolve all visions into the natural state. What is left? Then dissolve even your thought itself into the natural state so there is nothing left. Then you will realize that everything is made by your thought everything comes from there. You have to realize how things are created. You must practice this seriously for at best three months, or at least one month. Tulepin comments that it is necessary to practice in this way as a preliminary to the main practice so the mention of time requirements is quite serious and deliberate. Think that it is very important to make such a period of prepara, tin, and not just for a little while. Therefore prepare as much as you can. Apart from eating and sleeping, this practice should be carried on for the entire day. If you go to an empty valley or cave, what else is there to do? This is serious practice, not like the common NGO NDRO. This is for the person who is absolutely fed up with worldly life. Otherwise it is difficult to give up all the other things. Regarding this we asked Leighton whether it was absolutely necessary to go to a solitary place for this practice, and he said that it was not. If we can't, we should at least the result is seeing that everything is created by your thought. Once you finally realize this you can check back to find its origin. All things are created by your thought and mind and if you look back to the source of your thought and mind you find that it disappears. It dissolves and goes back to its nature. That is the limit. Every individual thing is dependent on the mind. All worldly life, all the beings in the six realms are in the same situation. The purpose of this practice is to stop all desire for the worldly life to see that it is all created by our mind. The world is like a common mind. All human beings share the same vision, the same karma. Likewise for the beings in the other realms they all share a karmic vision of the world. Three keep to regular sessions and do it seriously in order to have results. He said that in the western lifestyle we have many free periods in which we can practice, so sometimes it may be even better than being a monk, because a monk has so many different duties and rituals to perform. Let him further comments that with regard to the content, the six realms visualization is one means, but there is also the realization of samsara as such. This is done exclusively. If you try to practice alongside all the worldly activities then it is very difficult not to be distracted. And if you don't do the NGO NDRO seriously then the other prak, Tysis will only look like leisure. Letton comments that although humans look at water and see water, beings of other realms look at the same thing and perceive it differently. When animals see it they only see it as something to drink, but not water. The hell beings see it as fire or ice. The pitas as some sort of dirty thing. 
What we see is always conditioned by our previous actions. We only see our own karma, that we can check from the clear example that if two or three people go together to see something they all see and feel different things. This gives an idea. Take the individual mind, for example. One person might think that he is good although others think he is bad. Internal practice The second part of the first preliminary practice is to stop desire through internal visualization and recitation. It should be done for at least seven weeks. The actual practice is not described in this text. Briefly, there is a mantra in sending lights to the six realms to purify all defilements. It is more connected to the tantric system. The second preliminary practice cycle. To stop desire for body, speech and mind 5 The practice for the body here one practices with the body. One stands up and places the soles of the feet together with the knees out and the hands joined above the head. The neck is bent to the chest. That is the body posture. One visualizes oneself as a three-pointed derichi, flaming and blue six. A mother may see a man as her son, but his wife sees him as a husband. All this is created by individual minds peer, pal see others through their preconceptions. Everything is created. This realization makes it possible for us to develop in positive or negative ways. But we are covered with our ignorance, for always we are grasping. If things exist as our grasping mind sees them, as objects that are real and fixed, then nothing can change in this world. But nothing is fixed. That is how we are deluded. It is to break this deluded perception that is the purpose of this practice. Letton comments that Shatter composed his own Kelic tunes here which are described in the main text. They are taken from the Zanjum Ninayu, Zanjum Sni and Brgyud, which has been published in Delhi. These internal practices are best done alongside the external practice in the same session. Letton comments that the three types of practice are best carried out in the same session, one type after another. Inhale the breath and hold it. Hold that posture until you cannot hold it any longer. At that point fall down backwards, exhaling with half strongly. Do this many times. This practice serves three purposes. First, it purifies the body. Second, the demons see the flaming vetra and leave you alone. And third, it stops desire for the body. The practice for the speech The second type of practice is for the speech. There are four subdivisions. Idipa, R-G-Y-A-S-G-D-A-V-P-A, Sealed, Tselyongpa, R-T-S-A-L-S-B-Y-O-N-G-P-A, Practice, Nimtselpa, M-N-Y-N-B-T-S-A-L-P-A, The Training, and Lemdavak Lamduji Zebdhug, To Put in the Way. The Seal, Idipa. There are three subdivisions. External Idipa. Hum is a seal for the impure mind. Hum is used since it symbolizes the Buddha mind. The practice is to sit cross-legged and gaze into space. Visualize your mind at the heart as a blue hum, then sound hum slowly many times. At the same time visualize the blue hum, emitting rays of little hums which come out through the right nostril filling up the universe with hum. Whatever the hum touches turns into another blue hum, everything both internally and externally. Your mind is completely absorbed into hum nothing else has happened, in. Always sound the hum, soft and long. Internal ide pa. Now sound hum in a fast rhythm, and imagine that all the hums dissolve one into another and come back to the heart through the left nostril. When they come to the inside of the body all the flesh and blood turns into hum so that the body is filled with hum. Hold this vision for a long time. The three points of the Darachi are made by the elbows and the hands. The purpose, DGOSPA, of Gaidapa. Thus you realize that no object, not even your body, is self-sustaining. Enough, in, not even your body, has independent material X, distance everything can be easily changed. When you have practiced long enough signs come, such as an unexpected vision of hum externally, or that you suddenly feel that your body is filled with hum. That is a sign that you have practiced Idepa enough. The practice of visions is Renishans, Tsel Yongpa. Whatever vision comes to mind is slash a slash, reflection, so this practice is to destroy whatever comes and dissolve it into mind. The practice is similar to before. Sitting with the five point body posture, seven visualize a dark blue hum inside the heart. Now you should sound the hum very strongly, very sharply, and visualize the hum as a very strong fire with swords, throwing off sparks like light, ning. This hum comes out through the right nostril in the form of many hums and whatever they touch they destroy. 
Finally they go through everything, and destroy in all directions. Everything is destroyed by this strong hum. Then again it comes back through the left nostril, and destroys all the material of your body. It also helps to send away all sickness and disturbance. It can even help in the formation of the jaw slash you jaw slash us, the body of light, by stopping all desire for the body. The signs that this has been practiced enough are to have the sudden vision that the universe is just an illusion and that your body is thin like a nut, in substantial. That is the sign. The training, named Salpa. The purpose here is to tame your mind and bring it under control. You practice by placing the stick in front of you and sounding hum continuously like a beat. Then many hums come out from the heart like beads, leave the body through the is to sit with the legs crossed, back straight, neck slightly bent, eyes looking to the chest, and mouth slightly open. Nostrils, and go to the base of the stick. They climb the stick like ants, wrapping around it. When the first one comes to the top of the stick it stops, facing you. The rest are wrapped around in a spiral. When thoughts disturb you, all the hums come back to the first hum at the heart. You have to spend some time doing this, and it brings the thoughts under control so you can meditate for as long as you want to. 4. To putting the way, lambda bug. This means to put the body, speech and mind into the right way to put them into the natural clear light. The practice is to think of a blue hum the size of the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. This represents your body, speech and mind everything. When you sound hum it moves to the right and left and then it moves off, traveling over the countryside, until finally it goes to countries that you have never seen. All the while say, hum, hum continuously. Then stop it by saying fed dot are strongly and suddenly. The vision disappears and you rest as you were you remain in your nature. This hum can go to the heavens or to Shambhala. Suddenly you stop it by sounding fet. By sounding fet you will stop thoughts and remain in the natural state. By carrying out this practice you will begin to have experiences, yams, of bliss, emptiness and clarity. The sign that you have carried out this practice enough is that you will be able to remain in the natural state without any doubt or effort. The practice for the mind, smyongpa, emspyongpa, these are direct methods of introduction to the natural state. The methods described above are all material ways to bring you to the natural state. Below are given 9 methods to bring you directly to this state. 8 Lepton comments that this part of the preliminary practice is done in sessions. First a section for body, then for speech and finally one for the mind, all in one session. As the first three methods come under the title where does it come from, where does it stay and where does it go? Holding the 5 point body posture, look back to the origin of thought and inquire whether the natural state is material, visible or invisible. You have to check back. You cannot find where this object is, or who is searching for it. When you try you lose everything. Like the sky that is the empty mind you start to realize the empty mind. Checking the normal worldly vision. When you realize this point you can try to destroy it but you will find nothing. Whatever you do, it is not possible to do anything with this empty nature. Even when all thoughts are stopped there is still a very bright and clear presence that is empty. That is called clear natural mind 9 if things were independent and self-sustaining then you could find out by checking all your visions of D, scribed above to discover their nature. But when you practice in this method, although vision comes as nor, before this is an intense process. Sometimes go out, but most of the time practice. Letton comments that we see all things as independent objects. We cannot see that all are reflections of the natural state. What we are seeing are all delusions that do not in fact exist independently. They are like the visions that come in dreams. However, if these visions were all independent and self-sustaining we would be able to determine this through a process of inquiry. Take this table, for example. If we ask whether the table can be found in the top, the sides, the legs or the bottom, we cannot find it. If something was independent and self-sustaining, that is, had inherent existence, it would remain after such inquiry. This is a very widely used method of analysis in Buddhism. See Jeffrey Hopkins' Meditation on Emptiness, Len, Don, Wisdom Books, 1983. Checking the object in this way is a simple procedure and not so difficult. The problem is in the reconstruction of perception. Mel, your understanding is different. You see that all visions are illusion. You have realized the nature of non-stop illusion. Looking to where the reflections come, the fifth method, 
the visions come to the mind, but where do they appear and who understands them? Who tastes sadness and happiness? If you look back to the mind's situation you will see that everything is made by the mind. But if you look to the mind you will see that the mind too seems to have no independent existence. Ten however, if the mind is not there, then who called the names and made the causes of existence? Therefore the mind must exist, and everything else exists in dependence on mind. Enough, in exists independently of mind. 11 Leppin comments that philosophy can be useful to introduce the DZOGCHEN view. Although you cannot explain the nature of mind, you can point to the place where it can be found, like a child pointing to the moon. Usually these POS do not discuss the view from a logical or analytical standpoint, because they are not trained to do so. This is not the case in the Ben tradition, however, where a school of philosophy in to DZOGCHEN has developed. In any case, the least a DZOGCHENPA can do is explain what he or she is doing and thinking. Letton comments that this use of mind is not in the sense of consciousness. It is the mind as the nature of mind. It is not like the Sitamatra, mind only, view. This reference to Sitamatra concerns the store consciousness or Kamzit Kungse. In this view it is where all the karmic traces are kept, and if you purify it you achieve Buddhahood. Although this term is used in DZOGCHEN, there it means the natural state, the base, and there is no concept of purification. The base is primordially pure kedag, kadag, pure from the beginning. So the practice is not purification but recognition of the state. Take the external world, for example. In Sitamatra it is explained like the two halves of a hard-boiled egg that is cut down the middle, so that the object side and the subject side nothing exists beyond the natural state. Earth is not independent of the natural state. Stone is not independent of the natural state. Visions are not independent visions. Everything is a vision of the natural state. The natural state is like a single point. The natural state is like where birds fly behind there is no trace. If you understand this point you will realize that the natural state is the creator of all things the king of creators. Of an individual existence match. But DZOGCHEN says that everything is encompassed by the natural state, which has the power to make and take reflections. What is reflected in the mind does not independently exist. Both internal and external are spontaneous reflections in the natural state. To do this is a natural quality of the primordial state, but it does not mean that these reflections are solid, independent and inherently existent. They arise from the natural state and go back to it. It is our ignorance that grasps them as independent. So Sitamatra philosophy is often confused with DZOGCHEN. In Sitamatra it is said that both the objective and the subjective worlds arise from karmic causes. In DZOG, Chen, however, the world spontaneously exists. It is Kendi, Tibbon by Karma, but its source is the natural state. Madhyamaka philosophy does not accept the concept of Kums at all, however, it only accepts the six types of consciousness, senses, and mind, rather than the eight of Sitamatra and DZOGCHEN. In those systems, after the six senses, the seventh is Nyunya, Nyenid, emotions, and the eighth is Kums. An analogy is sometimes used. The mind is the husband and Nyunya is the wife. Kunzi is the storehouse and the senses collect the goods that come into the storehouse from the outside. So DZOGCHEN holds many aspects in common with Sitta, Matra, and the object side and the subject side are inseparable in both systems. Crucially, however, in DZOGCHEN the natural state is pure from the beginning and is always present. There is nothing to purify and nothing to reach. Realization without speaking or thought, the sixth method. One might say that if the natural state exists then some, where it must appear, but nothing appears so, therefore the natural state does not exist. It is always without a trace, in past, present or future. But even though the natural state does not appear it is always there. This awareness is of a sort that you can never catch by thought, and you cannot name it or show it by letters. If you try to show it by sounds or signs you never go exactly to the nature of this awareness. Whatever you do to study or check in this way, you will be like a dumb man who tastes sugar he can taste but he cannot explain to others how the flavor tastes. In the same way this nature cannot be thought and cannot be captured by words. When you understand this then you realize the natural state without speaking or thought. 
The natural state does not exist because it is not material. The seventh method. The natural state does not exist either because there is no method to remove it. It cannot both exist and not exist. Neither is the natural state beyond existence and non-existence. There is no place for it to rest. Therefore the nature of mind is completely beyond limits. If you understand this you understand the great limitless mind that is beyond the four limits one, let and comments that these are existence, non-existence, both or neither. Thus you have nothing to grasp at. If you grasp at things, you must bind them by one of the four limits. The realization that is beyond thought and without name, the eighth method. In the first place the natural state is completely beyond thought and the objects of thought. It is in no way an object of thought. You cannot show it by example. Whatever you do you can do nothing with this. However when you check back to the source of thoughts you cannot find anything you just come back to the nature of mind itself. It is not separate from object and subject, nor from names, nor can any thoughts seize its nature. When you understand this without thinking you realize the mind without name that is beyond thoughts. The realization of the spontaneous mind without doing. The ninth method. Even if you do not search or study any thing the natural state is always with you from the limitless beginning. There is nothing to lose and nothing to find. If you search in yourself can you find it? Therefore you should not speak about searching for the nature of mind. From the beginning it was always with you and never separate from you. No other beings can see the nature of your mind. It is always self-originated. When you realize this you have realized the naked basic data maker. The DZOGCHEN view checking where the natural state comes from, where it stays and where it goes in this section you first check where does the natural state come from and who is coming. The method to check this is, when a thought comes without planning, to ask the question whether it comes from existence or non-exist, and say, look into where it comes from. If you think it comes from existence and the external realms, say from the earth, mountains or houses, or from the internal realms inside the body or brains, then check each pose, civility individually. Check them and go back to these items. If you do this where can you find the source? Secondly, you might think it is coming from the empty sky but if so, then where is the source in the sky? This source must be one of the elements, but if you look at air, fire, earth or water you cannot find your thoughts there. If you check in this way you still cannot find where they come from. The natural state is like a wind that comes suddenly from nowhere. So just look to the natural state, whether it is something material, whether it has color, what it looks like. Can you find out anything about it? Nothing can be found. Then suddenly you have lost both subject and object. 2. That means that you realize it without grasping. It is a method for introduction of preliminary practice, not the final DZOGCHEN view. That is called the endless view. It is the basic Dhammic guy for the base, the path Dhammic guy for the path and for the fruit the final Dhammic guy. When you understand this nature you understand the nature of the Dhammic guy. Where does it stay and who stays there? We must check these things. If you think that the natural state exists, then where is it right now? If you take all the material things and check them, things go back to the atoms and finally disappear like the sky. You cannot find the place where they reside. And if you cannot find the place where they stay, who stays there? What remains is a very bright clearness that will stay with you. If you try to recognize who is staying in both realms, you cannot find anything neither in the object side nor in the subject side. Without thinking or speaking, it is the presence of brightness and clarity. The presence is very clear. According to the path it is called the self, brightness of practicing, and according to the fruit it is called the unstoppable Sandragagaya. Where does it go and who goes there? After a little while you will have to think back to ask where the thoughts go. If you look externally, you cannot find their destination. Everything just disappears. Even if you were to find some thing, you would have to ask, who is going? When you try to find out, everything disappears. It is self-disappearing. It is self-purified. You did not do anything, but delusion was purified. You do not try to purify nor do you do anything with the pure perceptions. Everything spontaneously appears and is self-liberating into emptiness. According to the path this is called without trace of acting, and according to the fruit the unseparable manakaya. You must look hard to where the thoughts are going. Just as a wind disappears, they disappear into space. 
they are self-liber, ed and go into self-liberation. When you have this exp, reins you see the ungrasping manakaya. Usually we think that it is my mind that is always thinking. But when you ask where it comes from, where it goes and where it stays you cannot find any place. That is called the collapse of the house of the mind. When you realize this you reach the great nature and selflessness without end, to drell chenpa, mtha apostrophe brell chenpa. When you come to this nature there is no need to check or to do anything there is no action and there is nothing to do. This is the unification of brightness and emptiness and is the great nature of D-Z-O-G-P-A-C-H-E-N-P-O. When you realize this it is called the coming to direct cognition of the natural state. So ends that preliminary practice. 3. Letton comments that you must not go on beyond this point unless the realization it describes has been reached with, out checking, object, or any grasping. This is bright clarity and emptiness united. You must not even grasp for the unification itself. Only when this has been reached can the practices that follow bear fruit. There must be a clear presence with no grasping, that is the fruit of the preliminary practice. Drenpanam Kar Book 2 The Practice of Trecho Tibetan Text 20b, Line 5 Essential Teachings For the practice first of all we should get into the right state for the essential ripening of the mind. For this purpose it is necessary to receive the initiation. However, if you come through this preliminary practice you will receive initia, too and with the practice itself one leading to the essential teachings there are two sub-divisions. The first division explains the context of the teachings and the second teaches in detail the practice. Letton comments that when you receive initiation it is to show you the natural state. Afterwards you can check whether you received anything by seeing whether you then perfectly understand the natural state. However, if you do the preliminary practices you will see the natural state. So that is the initiation in itself. The context this section begins with a quote from the Namkartrulzo, Namkartrulm said. It says that in DZOGCHEM, there are three types of wrong teachings. The first are wrong teachings that are incorporated into DZOGCHEM, the second, end are misinterpretations of the teaching and the third category are the wrong teachings that are automatically stopped to, for example, the way the mistaken teachings have been incorporated into DZOGCHEM is by putting the views of the eight lower vehicles into the teachings three, but according to the DZOGCHEM view you do not need to see that the eight views are negative they are spontaneously dissolved into a four quote from the Yetratezel, YKHRIMTHASL. In the ultimate DZOGCHEN view, you do not need to remove anything. You do not need to grasp, for DZOGCHEN does not follow the traces of the path and fruit of the stages. All grasping to external or internal view is liberated by itself. It is beyond the subject, object, obtaining the fruit or removing of defects. This view is the object of the best knowledge of the practitioner. The second mistaken view is to always wish and hope for very bright clearness or emptiness strongly grasp. This text is like the last category. If it is taught correctly, misunderstandings are automatically stopped and exam pleasure this are given in the text that follows. It is said that they have to be removed. The DZOGCHEN view is beyond these ways. It is the best and has to be practiced. But this view is itself mistaken because in thinking that the other ways are negative and DZOGCHEM is the best view you are keeping two sides the negative side and the positive side. But DZOGCHEN has no sides. If you are still grasping for the two sides you have not achieved the DZOGCHEN view. If you remain in the liberated state you do not need to keep or reject anything. In for many things, holding and wishing. It is bounded by wishing. That is also not good DZOGCHEN practice. If one is asked what is one's view, one answers, without negative or positive things should be left as they are. Then all bindings and obscurations are liberated by themselves. This view is beyond the decision of practicing and meditating. Without doing anything without any attempt to change your nature just let it go on kenting, housely. Then all the negative side and all the positive side is dissolved into its nature. There is no wrong view. For example, if a flood comes from the mountains, it washes all the shrubs and bushes and trees down to the valley. It is in this manner. Now in this DZOGCHEN text, we have three systems of teaching the pupils. 
One of these is called the system of teaching, the second the system of direct intrik, tiwan and the third the traveler who crosses mountains and having mistaken his way is then helped to find the right path. If you ask which system is being taught here, it is the first system. What is the second system? It is to introduce Trejpan Togol directly. The third system means to give gradual teachings. This teaching is of the first type because all teachings are contained in this one. The students that do not have the highest capacity must be taught gradually in self-awareness so as to remove slowly the obscurations of thoughts and thus move from samsara. This method I have already taught in the text DZ Do G P A C H E N P O K S M R A N G S H A R R D Z Do G S P H N P O S K U G S U M R A N G S H A R. The teaching here is for the practitioners of best capacity. So how is it taught? The manner of its teaching, especially Bardo and Fao teachings, which are given in Book Four of this text. In this work, Shaka collected many quotations from diff French sources on Trecho, Total and Dark Retreat, etc. Is suddenly to introduce everything in a moment like a lightning strike. The basis of it is naturally liberated from the beginning. To this base you add nothing but are introduced directly to it so that you understand it fully. Seven details of the practice the practitioner of best capacity does not need to meditate or contemplate, but needs to make a decision. By this firm decision, he or she is liberated. This is the method of the Trecho system. By the teachings of TSGL one reaches the fulfillment of the visions of the three kinds and so achieves the rainbow body at the end of the lifetime. The teachings of Trecho, there are two subdivisions according to two capacities of pupils. For the lower division, there is a quote from Vomi, Dime Book of the Zamjhu Ninayu, the Drinkposera Zak Drinkposera BZHAG. The visions are all introduced into the mind, the mind is introduced to the emptiness and the emptiness is introduced to the clear light. The clear light is introduced to the unification and the unification is introduced to the great bliss. The reason for this is that when you introduce the visions to the mind this causes the cessation of the sense that appearances are self-sustaining. When you introduce the mind to emptiness, that causes the cessation Buddhahood is then self-achieved. During this life you achieve the base and so you feel very safe and secure. You live with the confidence of a look, for whom samsara has no fears. The book of collected experiences of practitioners called colloquially the Nyam Gyu, Nyamsa Gyud. Introduced means shown directly. Of the ignorant thoughts that grasp after truth. When you directly show the clear light to emptiness, that causes the cessation of the misunderstanding of your nature. And when you show the unification to the clear light that is the unification of awareness and nature. When you directly show the great bliss to the unification, you realize the naked nature of emptiness and awareness without being born, stopping or resting in any place. 4. Letton comments that if you grasp after the emptiness, it is not right, if you grasp after awareness that is not right and even if you grasp after unification it is not right. The real DZ Do G C H E N nature is unification, but unification is a state of being, not an object of knowledge. Now for this first system of teaching, the direct showing, one needs the personal advice of the teacher in this manner. The vision itself is not mind, and the mind is neither form nor vision. If you ask what the mind is you must understand that all the visions come from karmic traces. 5. Like the Sitamatra, mind only, system. Because the mind has kept various karmic traces, they can be awakened, and so by the cause of the traces of previous action the visions appear. Even though these visions appear they have no inherent existence. The direct introduction according to Smed, Emst, the basic nature of the natural state, Buddhasatta, is the base of all reflections. It is like an ocean. All kinds of reflections can appear in it one. Thus the ocean equally reflects all images the sun, the moon and the stars. That you must know. From the point of view of Buddhasatta, the natural state, you cannot explain the difference between the base, the energy or the reflections. That is because its nature is emptiness, that is, the natural state, and to emptiness there is no distinction between them. For example, in the ocean itself, the clearness of the water, energy, and the reflections in it are not different from the water they appear, but they are not beyond the water. If you look from the point of view of the reflections, that is, individual things, there is no contradiction either. From that perspective, you can see that the ocean and its clarity and reflections are distinct from one another. However, according to the natural state none of the reflections has a real base. 
there is no inherent exist, and say in them. A quote from Leedum Draw I Dampa, FSRGYUDDANG Dryaba Idams Pa. In this connection there is no speak, in about emptiness and vision. Both emptiness and vision have no base. Therefore the Smith system is only for leading the followers of lowest capacity into DZADOGCHEM, and it is also called the Great Seal, Mehandra. For the text Shaktra, Vokkhrid, by Trugal Yundran, Jabraji Yalundrung and his followers was accepted as the highest teaching, but this is not the case. It cannot you cannot say the natural state is empty or has reflections or whatever. Like water which is also wet, it is both things at once neither term captures this reality, which is beyond words. You can't say it is empty, because it is not graspable if you say that it is empty you try to enter the state whilst grasping the concept of emptiness. The real fact is beyond all concepts. This is a reference to the Mehamdra system. Smed is the aspect of Dze Do and that most stresses emptiness and so the author here says that it is similar to Mehamdra. Mehamdra emphasizes and grasps emptiness, but here nature is left as it is, without trying to act upon it, without meditating, visualizing or contemplating. Letton comments that Smed, Ms S D E, Long Plong S D E, and Mangajti, Man and Gag S D E, are all aspects of Dze Do G C H E M, because they recognize as the final truth the unification of awareness and emptiness. Smet emphasizes more the emptiness side, and long the awareness. But both are unified, which is the essence of the Dze Do G C H E N view, the union of emptiness and awareness. Mehamdra is the union of emptiness and bliss, and as Tsunkapa explained very clearly the emptiness referred to as that of the Madhyamaka view. This is not the view of emptiness referred to in Dze Do G C H E N. Many schools have terms and propositions which are very similar to those of Dze Do G C H E M, and this has led to some confusion when this label has been applied to other Cs, Thames. For example, Sekhu Pandita was very explicit in condemning Dze Do G C H E N as not being a Buddhist view at all. All the Dze Do G C H E N texts make special mention of the need to separate out all the other views in order to make clear the meaning of the terms in the context of Dze Do G C H E N alone. At the very beginning you must know the other views, but they are to be discarded as this is the highest and best vehicle. Many Dze Do G C H E N teachers at present are teaching that Mahamdra and Madhyamaka and Dze Do G C H E N views are not different. But this is not found in the literature at all. Be compared with the highest teaching any more than the earth can be compared with the sky. 6. Letton comments that Trugal Yundring was the author of the 8KHRID in 15 sessions, which was composed in the 11th century. Shadza is criticizing this text because it is mainly smed. The direct introduction according to Mengaji for the best practitioners there is a second direct introduction. They can be liberated just after being shown directly. This instruction is given in two subdivisions. The first is the direct introduction, and the second con concerns the decision to enter into the great non-action. The direct introduction now concerning the direct introduction, there are three methods of teaching. The first is to comment on the importance, the second is to tie up and the third is to bind. The first method, the comment on the importance, here there are two methods. To show directly the root awareness and to show the view, practice, action and fruit. To show directly the root awareness. There are three descriptions of awareness writ par. The first is nken, passing awareness, the second is awareness of thinking and the third is primordial awareness. The first means the awareness of the Buddha who encompasses all beings. The second is that of some of the schools of meditation like Vipassana, insight, where awareness is practiced in meditation. There if you do not practice it you do not see the awareness, and sometimes it is clear and sometimes not. The third is according to this view it is the real awareness of Dze Do G P A C H E N P O. It is always there whether you are practicing meditation or not, or whether you realize it or not. Whether you know it or not does not matter. What follows below is to show you this awareness directly. 7. Letton comments that this third type of awareness is with you whether you know it or not. But normal sentient beings are not aware of this part of their nature. This can best be explained by a little story. There was once an old lady who had a lump of gold lying on the floor of her thatched cottage. 
One day a prince came and saw the gold, and he asked the lady, Why are you so poor? The old lady answered that she was just a poor peasant. The prince pointed out that a treasure was there, since the old woman had not recognized the riches that were hers. Only when the prince, the teacher, came did the old lady, Senator, Shen Bean, see the riches, the natural state. Of course, the gold was unaffected whether the old lady saw it or not. The view, practice, action and fruit. First of all sit down in the seven-point posture. 8. The seven-point posture is to sit with crossed legs, hands in equipoise, spine straight, neck bent, eyes open, mouth open, tongue on palate. Then the master calls to the student and says, Oh good child, is there any watcher or thing that is watched? And to where? Or not? You cannot find any object to be watched or a watcher who watches it. At that moment everything goes as the sky. Do not change or do anything. That nature is inexpressible. At that moment there are no names or con, sets of clarity, emptiness or unification. You cannot show this by example. You cannot check it or recognize it by thoughts. You are unable to remove it, yet it never goes away. There is no root it is empty. While you are in this state clarity is there without seas, in, non-stop and purified. The clarity is the self-created clarity and there is no antidote. It will always be in bliss. Always naked, it cannot be deluded. You can't say what, you have seen, but it is always bright. Its nature is without ceasing. It is the inexpressible nature and unremovable wisdom. There is no subject, for the visions are just there. Without thoughts clarity is there. Without distinguishing subject and object, wisdom is there. This is the wisdom without object or subject, without substance. It is the great secret path of the great perfection the hard blood of the Dakinas and is the gift of Drenpanam Ka, Drenpanam Mkha. It is also the essential teaching of Ritparan Shah, Ritparan Shah, percent have you understood? You realized it. Wonderful. The second method, to tie up this is given in four sections, the view, the practice, the activities and the fruit. The view of being up. This means that all the views are tied up in emptiness, because all the visions in mind are kept without change or trying to change them. Everything comes as it is. Without doing anything and with no delusions you can see clearly. The vision comes suddenly like the flash made when lightning strikes. It is called the vision that comes as suddenly as lightning comes down. A quotation from the text Nam Ka Trulji Adiza Do Chem, Nam Mkha Frulji Adiza Do Dchem. Just now these very sends and minds are all seen without any covering, very brightly and clearly. They come without planning, therefore they are sudden. They are self-originated, therefore they are called lightning. All the visions are without stopping and without inventing. They come spontaneously, and everything is self-originated. This is why they are said to be like lightning. This is the first of the four ways to tie up with views. The practice and activities for tying up. All the practice is aimed at seeing directly with full awareness. This is because when the thoughts suddenly arise, just at that moment they are self-liberated, if you are aware of them. That is called directly hit. 9. Letton comments that while you are in awareness, when thoughts arise, then they are self-liberated. If you are not in awareness, then the thoughts can lead you. Quoting from the text as before, thoughts arise suddenly. There is no certainty as to where they are coming from. Therefore it is directly hit. Whatever rep, pairs is only self-originated. Thus, ignorance has no place to hide and it is called directly hit. It is clearly seen how awareness and normal vision are connected and this is called directly hit. When awareness and vision are left as they are without any change that is called directly hit. Once you have understood these methods there is nothing beyond them, nothing to meditate on. That is called directly hit. Now all the activities are tied up with the self energy, netted wisdom that comes naturally. Whenever you perform any of the four activities, ten, the four activities are reading, sleeping, sitting and death, getting so at all times you should keep the natural state. Without trying to plan or change anything but simply leaving everything as it is, that is called the spontaneously originated wisdom. From the same text another quote, nothing is being stopped and everything appears naturally. It comes automatically. Nothing is being done particularly. This is why it is said that everything is coming automatically. If you act normally there is nothing wrong. 
Whatever you do, everything is the reflection of emptiness, and therefore it is the automatically originated appearance. There is nothing to remove, collect or desire, therefore it is automatically originated. Everything comes into the emptiness, and there is nothing to agree or disagree with, therefore everything is automatically originated. All the time your body, speech and mind are left as they are there are no antidotes. That is the looseness without binding and tightness. It is a happy mind. The fruit of tying up. All the fruits are tied to the three bodies that are self-originated because whatever rep, pairs and whatever comes it is as though it does not matter, good or bad. This is because thought is self, originated from the natural state and that is called the fruit self-originated from the three bodies. Quoting from the same text, the self-originated Dhammakaya is like the sky. The Sampurgakaya is self, originated like the four elements of earth, water, fire and winds. The Nmanakaya is self-originated as the six realms of beings. Wisdoms are all self-originated as the five poisons of the emotions. All things self net naturally from awareness and all are connected with awareness. Therefore there is nothing left to remove or to tie up with practition. Now one might ask, if everything is self-originated and goes back to the natural state, then what is this samsara that we are living in? Do you think this is the final truth and that there are not defilements? What you said is contradictory. The DZDOGCHEN view replies that there is nothing contradictory in this statement, because to the DZDOGCHEN practitioner everything is self-originated. In this natural state there is no antidote to apply, for there are no negatives there is nothing to be removed. This is proven by the following quote from the Melangu SLGIU, Melangu said to slash e read, The view is like lightning that comes from the sky no one can stop it. The practice of meditation is like the sun shining in the sky all the darkness naturally disappears. When a flood comes from the mountain it washes all the rocks and trees and shrubs down to the valley. That is like the activity. When you have found the wish, in due your wishes are perfectly fulfilled that is the fruit. The third method, the binding this is again described in four sections view, ditta, tin, activities and fruit. All of these are bound into normal vision which has no base. It is just left as it is that is the binding. Concluding summary the conclusion is that everything is awareness and emptiness. That is the single point, everything is in this. There is nothing to do with body, speech and mind. This view ties up all the ends. All samsara and nirvana are liberated without doing anything. This is the natural unification which is unborn and unending without do, in anything you just leave it as it is. That is to tie up with the five points 21 the five points are, 1, to stop, 2, to put into one single point, 3, to tie up without doing anything, 4, to liberate all samsara and nirvana. And, 5, that everything is unified ceaselessly into the unified natural state. The decision to enter into the great non-action decisions without action has three subdivisions. The first is in general to remove all faults. The second is to explain what the decision without action means. And third is to decide to practice without practicing. As a general introduction, someone may challenge the view by asking, if as you say everything is self-liberated whether you understand or not, and samsara and nirvana are self-liberated for all time past and future, then surely you do not need to do anything. It seems that you hold the wrong view that there is nothing to do. In reply one says that if one decides to enter the great acting without action, then there are twelve methods of acting. If one does more than these one is doing too much and one will circulate in samsara even more deeply. 11. These twelve are described in the sections that follow, as the four achievements, the three capacities of understanding and the five points of the decision without action. A quote from the Trotrul and Cardin N M G U Spros Brown M M K H A apostrophe N M N M P R G V U D amplifies this point. If you are doing too much, you cannot stay in the real truth. If you take on many activities, that means you are following the path of evil. Therefore remain loosely and without delusion in the self-liberate, in path without action. But then some may say, surely is this not still the mistaken view that you don't need to do anything because everything is self-liberated? One replies, yes, this is the case, but it is neither mistaken nor contradictory. I do not need to do a thing more. Now all visions are helpful and without fault. Truly, once you are in the natural state every action is like practicing the accumulation of merits. The second subdivision explains in detail the nature without action.
It has three parts. First of all there are the four achievements, then there are the three key ties of understanding, and finally there is the decision without action, which has five points. The four achievements. These are, to be able to do the opposite of what one thinks is the right action. When one has achieved this capacity of acting without any concept of good or bad, it does not matter if one is criticized or not, everything is equal. The person who has achieved this capacity is never involved in actions or thoughts to if one who has achieved this capacity is criticist, that person does not modify his or her view. One is not deluded by others. These are the four achievements of the person who has achieved the natural state. The three capacities of understanding. These are, of course, the practitioners who have achieved this capacity will have clairvoyance. But they do not care for these signs even if the Dhammakaya appears very brightly in front of them. They have fully understood that everything is part of their nature, so they are neither happy nor sad to see this. That is the first sign that no one can remove the practitioner from his or her nature. Of course, even if sickness and miseries come, the practitioners do not care. If the king of hell comes and puts molten metal in their mouths, if the demons come to take them away, they know that these appearances are not separate from their own nature. So no one can make the prakti to and are afraid. That is the sign that your she will not fall down. Letton comments that if you don't do anything it does not matter from the point of view of emptiness. Of course, it is different from the point of view of the practitioner. These differences are not different at source so there are not two truths. The practitioner is not, after all, the source. There is only one source, but to one who is grasping there is a limited point of view. Many teachings seem very similar to these A-D-O-G-C-H-E-N, but all teachings are bounded by thought. If you go back to their origin, there are always precepts that say this is the right way and that is the wrong way. Once you have this back, ground you are bounded by thoughts. But these A-D-O-G-C-H-E-N has no background. This is difficult to explain as everything these A-D-O-G-C-H-E-N says is for the practitioner with capacity. This difference of view is very important to understand. JJ, of course, practitioners can spontaneously give many teachings without study, as the teachings will be known spontaneously by the power of their understanding. Thus they will have a good reputation and so achieve power and knowledge to conquer their critics. They do not care even if they see the Sambhagakaya or see Tom Pashahinra teaching under his umbrella, they never change from their nature. They know that everything is not different from their nature. So they do not follow good or bad. That is the sign of the capacity of the practice the practitioners will never be stopped, nor will they go back from their nature. Practitioners have no hope to achieve nirvana nor are they frightened to fall down to samsara. They do not wish to do good things. Those practitioners who have this capacity do not doubt any longer. But if a practitioner is still doubtful as to whether he or she is acting in the right way or not, or whether he or she has got the right sign or not, then that person has not yet achieved this capacity. He or she will continue to circulate in samsara. The decision without action. Now comes the third part, the decision without action, which has five subdivisions. They are, activity cannot bring Buddhahood because all activities are material and therefore impermanent. Nature and final truth are like the sky. No active, it can bring emptiness. Therefore just decide to enter the great nature without action. A quote from the Trotel Nom Kartanibraiu. If anyone enters the nature without action, whether that being is a god or a human or in any one of the six realms, the nature of mind will always be purified spontaneously into natural truth. And whoever wants to get into this nature should not make any kind of action only remain in the final truth. There are no obscurations or negativity in the natural state. From the beginning everything is liberated into the realms of great bliss of self, clarity. Therefore there is no need to apply antidotes. A quote from Kunzen De Wulung, Kun Bize De Ng Bde Beril, from the highest mandalas of Buddhas down to the ground, including all the external and internally existent things, nothing is beyond the great bliss. Therefore everything is not far from Buddhahood. Whatever appears or comes, everything is the reflection of wisdom. Everything is like an honor, meant of the natural state and is self-liberated. All the visions appear as wisdom. Therefore one must decide to enter the path of the equal taste. 
A quote from the days gone pet to a IU, B D E G S H E G S D G O N G S P A D U S P A R G Y U D 7. Whatever your thoughts are doing, rising or moving, the natural state and awareness has never been damn aged by them. Everything spontaneously exists. That is the great fruit of the self pure liberation. It is also the pure clarity wisdom. All the various visions are light reflections of the natural state. All the existences that belong to samsara and nirvana are reflections that come from the natural state. All of them will be liberated into the natural state. Just at the moment when they reflected they're ready to be liberated there is no need to try to liberate them. Therefore decide to enter the self-liberation. A quote from the 10th chapter of the text above. This is the automatic cutting off of the miss, takes or obscurations. From the beginning it is beyond the views of nihilism and eternalism. Here nothing is said about them for all an etch, rally liberated into the pure, great, naturally liberated. From the standpoint of the natural state, whether you understand this natural self-awareness or not is not affected. It is completely beyond the ends of samsara and nirvana. 12. Letton comments that this means it has no end at all and is beyond concept. The DZOGCHEN nature has no end and no beginning. From an individual point of view nirvana might be seen as having a beginning, however, for the practitioner must become a Buddha. But in this teaching all things are but equal. If you do not realize the natural state, the natural state never goes bad. Therefore its nature is completely beyond samsara. It is liberated beyond the end of samsara. If you try to search or to look, you have only understood a little part. In this nature there is no side to be taken. Therefore this is liberated from the ends of all the eight parts whatever you do, everything is naturally self-liberated. There is nothing to look for and nothing to find. And there is no certain action. Therefore now you can live without worry, for you have realized the open space of your mind. Deciding to practice without practice when you have fully understood the natural state then all doubts are stopped. A qualm. Surely if everyone who exists acts without action then whatever practices are done in the lower eight parts must be without purpose? The DZOGCHEN reply is that everything that is practiced in those parts is made up by thoughts, and their practitioners never achieve the stage of acting without action, without thoughts. DZOGCHEN never pursues them, but all their achievements, like Sambhagakaya or Dahamakaya or Purification, and of knowledge are naturally present in DZOGCHEN Buddhahood. The reason for this is that all existing things are like illusions coming from the natural state. Therefore there is not any medview, as everything is liberated into the natural state. 29 Latin comments, why do they criticize this view? It is because all these schools, even the tantric schools, depend on visualization, body posture, breathing, etc. Quote from the same text. The ways of the eight practices are archon like the stars are archon by the rising sun. DZOGCHEN does not need a plan to achieve Buddhahood. Everything comes from remaining in the natural state to spontaneously exist. Therefore to the nature of the DZOGCHEN view there is nothing to do with acting. Day and night remain in the natural state without any action, even planning or thinking, no expecting, no reciting, no visualizing even during sleep. So the practitioner practices days, months and years without distraction in the natural state. All the four actions are carried out without distraction. The practitioner is contemplation. Everything is the unstoppable action. Whatever the practitioner experiences, whatever comes is an experience for the practice, happiness, bliss or whatever. He or she does not even care if the thoughts are racing there is no hope or path so thoughts are left as they are. That is the method of practice. Sometimes there are raging emotions, like am, rare or sorrow or whatever, and the practitioner does not care. They are just left as they are. This is the teaching. Whether the practitioner collects merits or sins does not matter, things are left just as they are. Not far away from the natural state, the practitioner leaves behind no trace. 13. Letton comments that while the practitioner is not dis- Trapped it but is continuously in the natural state it is as if he or she is in space whatever is done, no traces are left behind. As we said, whether you paint black or white on space nothing remains. The base that keeps the traces is lost, it is empty. There is no base of keeping past actions. That is the practice of the DZOGCHENPA. 
there is no trying to practice antidotes or removing negativities that is the fruit. And not to seek antidotes that is the commitment. Everything is to be left as it is. 32 There achieved continuous contemplation. For other people who still grasp their karmic traces this does not apply. When the Latin first came to Sway and Nepal in 1944 he met some Tibetans with whom he traveled for some days. One man was a former monk who had a wife and children and was carrying a huge load of luggage on his back. When he was a monk he had met Deed Rinpoche, a famous D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N-P-A, in the mountains and consequentially he gave up his robes because he felt he was too tied up with the Vimy of vows. But Leppin pointed out that he was equally tied up with his children. The man replied that in D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N, it is said that it does not matter what you do so he was free to do anything and that was okay. But this is a complete misunderstanding of D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N. The teachings only apply when you are totally absorbed in the natural state. It depends on your practice and only you can judge. So it is a paradox that beginners must take actions even though the ultimate D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N view has no action. The beginner must take a very strong action or decision at, otherwise there will be doubt and hesitancy. All the prepara, Tory methods help us realize the natural state. But once it is seen and understood then the situation is different. The experience D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N-P-A would not need to do prepara, Tory practices at all. Letton comments that this means not hesitating or meditating, and this is why many Buddhist masters criticize D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N. For example, Tsongkhapa asserted that the natural state in D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N is just like being unconscious. Far from that, this awareness is very bright and clear. But the Indian commentators on the Prishna Paramita, such as Nagar, Jnuna, did not understand this awareness that is present after thoughts have stopped. They do recognize something similar, the deluded direct cognition of Snugata, void. This cognition is inseparable from its object and deluded, but it is not the same. Is no measure of being understood or not understood, that is the sign of the practitioner's knowledge. Another criticism might be put in this way. You say that the D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N view is not limited, yet here you say no action is your view. Is this not a contradiction? The answer to this lies in non-action. From the D-Z-O-G-Chen view this term means no action, but from the practitioner's point of view this is not a choice one just as what comes next in the natural state. But to explain it a term must be used. Whether it is to look or not to look, to act or not to act, everything is self-liberated. Therefore there is no missed view or right view I do not it may seem the same because here the object is snooter and the subject is direct cognition. But the difference is that this cognition is the fruit of practice by thought. First you practice and then you have the experience. You develop it until the thoughts gradually diminish and the object becomes more and more clear. Finally the object is perceived directly. So it is a result of thought. Even if there is a gulf in the progression to the final stage of direct cognition, the connection between thought and direct cognition cannot be denied. If there was no link between the two then nothing could bridge it. But from the D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N point of view the nature is already connected. It is not linked with thoughts, because it is already there. It has always been there. It is not invented. Whatever is in you, that you can realize. Purification is needed for D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N, however, that is the reason for the preliminary practices. It is a great error to try to apply these teachings without this period of preparation. You must always understand the perspective of any comment be it about the natural state or the individual. Otherwise you fall into nihilism. 33 Lepton comments that in the philosophical background to D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N, there are various mistaken views which are described in the Namkar Trulzo, Nem Mkha Floral M D-Z-O-D, a major text on the philosophy of D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N taught at Dellinger, the view that you must meditate, or that you must not meditate, that there is no source of existence, or that samsara has no end. The view that D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N must be learnt in order to know it or that D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N has no connection with mind. The view that it has nothing to do with anything else or that the D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N view is not certain anything goes. That everything is nothing so you can do whatever you like, or that the view says that everything is faultless. These are the ignorant views. Better views but still mistaken a kadag, that the view is pure from the beginning.
Lundrup, ingrup, which means that everything spontaneously exists. That the view is not certain so it can be this or that. Or that the real natural state is nature and reflections. These are all partially complete views. Some of the masters of these do gchen introduce the view directly with a crystal or mirror. Some say you must go to a quiet place to meditate. Some say you must have hardship and others that you must be a beggar. Some of the masters say that you must give up all your property and go and live in a cemetery or in the mountains. Some again say, go now and live as a madman. Some say, don't desire anything, go and live as a small child. Others say you must live the opposite of what they teach. Some say, you should avoid objects that cause anger and desire and don't expect to have a good reputation. Others say whether people say good or bad things about you, you should not care. These are the sayings of the Dze Do Gchen masters. But according to this system we don't accept any teachings of theirs. We don't think that their teachings are either good or bad we don't care. Why? Because we are completely outside of the judgment of their points. There is no point in arguing or judging. We don't care. Like the elephant if he is thirsty no one can stop him from going to the water. All these different views have been bounded by thought and so are grasping. This process has the purpose of bringing out doubts to clarify them like washing stains from a cloth so that one sees the material clearly. Book 3 The Practice of Togol Tibetan Text 27 and Line 6 The Togol section has two parts. First there is the explanation of why Togol is higher than Trecho, then there is the teaching of the Togol path. First, in the text Yetra, E-K-H-R-I, there are ten points to distinguish Trecho from Togol. Here is a summary in seven points. One the first is in the ways of purifying grasping. In Trecho all the mountains, rocks and countries have to be thought of as illusions, otherwise this teaching can not liberate directly on its own. Togol, however, D. Letton comments that the distinctions are being made between the two techniques in order to clarify them in relation to one another, and not to suggest that either can work on its own. Without the fundamental practice of the Trecho view, the Togol will have no meaning, although it will work. With our Trecho the foundation is not safe for Togol. Many people are keen to do a dark retreat straight away, but without treks, there is no base for the visions to come. If you hope to see strange things you can, but it will have no meaning. This is explained below. Tukya tro atosako kaging pens on the five lights by which all the objects of existence are completely liberated into light. Quote from the Yetra. It is originally purified. There is no grasping. That nature is called the great Buddhahood. The second point is in the matter of the self-vision of the body. In Trecho the body cannot become the live body it can only be made to disappear to the level of the atoms too. There are many systems to make the physical body disappear, such as the temporary illusory body. Even in the practice of Shamatha the physical body can disappear. But they are not true or final. TBGEL, however, completely transforms the physical body into pure light. If you don't achieve the rainbow body then you do not achieve the final body. Likewise, if you do not achieve the great rainbow body, you have not achieved the final Buddhahood. In total all your physical body and the objects that you share go into the rainbow body. 3 Lepton comments that this refers to the body becoming so subtle that you cannot see it with the naked eye, as if it transforms into very fine particles. There are many other results of practice in the other traditions. In Mahendra, for example, the body disappears and the illusory body is realized. It is not that the physical becomes the illusory body. The physical body dies as in the normal case, but the mind realizes the illusory body. Letton comments that just as the karmic causes make the world of experience, each individual person has his or her share of this common vision. For example, a person, say a man called John, is part of the common vision, but his mother will see him as her son, and his wife will see him as her husband. That is their personal share. So along with the physical body, whatever is a person's share goes into the body of light in the final transformation. The body of light is all that is left after all karmic vision is purified. The entire body goes into light, but not the material things and property they remain part of the common karmic vision. Per drugs kemper if one becomes a rainbow body one's light body has no defects. It is completely purified and karmic causes have completely stopped. Previously one practiced no, to sitter. 
Now one has received the result, so until samsara is finished one will help sentient beings for when a man dies, he leaves behind possessions, furniture and houses, but the vision that this is mine or that is mine dies with him. No one will think this is mine of one of his former possessions unless it has been given to her or she buys it. So karmic links are everything, but there are two aspects, the public side and the personal side. This is not like the Hinayana view, however, in which it is believed that after the Buddha showed the Paramyavana, there were no traces left, for he had completely gone non-existent. That is the final body of the Dharmakaya, permanent because it is non-manifest. The rainbow body is the manifest body of Buddhahood, the Sampurgakaya form, in which all the body, speech and mind are completely purified of all Kaya, mid-traces. As a Sampurgakaya form, this body is impermanent, although someone who has achieved the Jeljau slashes, realizes all three Kayas of the Buddhas. The Dahamakaya can be seen only by the Buddhas, the Sampurgakaya can be seen by the High Buddhas and the Nmanakaya form can be seen by ordinary beings, but only if they have the karmic causes to do so. All manifest bodies are impermanent. Even the Dahamakaya has two forms the Wis, Dom Dahamakaya, the awareness side, which is impermanent, and the nature Dahamakaya, the empty side, which is permanent. The unmanifest Dahamakaya cannot help beings, but its manifest aspect the Sampurgakaya form does so due to the everlasting Buddhasitta such as the union of clarity and emptiness. When you have purified all the defilements your mind is called the Dahamakaya and your body is called the Sam, B-H-O-G-A-K-A-Y-A. At the same time you have emanated teachings to all beings, that is called Manakaya. Generally we say quote from the Yetra, the visions of the five Ekra gates, Skandhas, are not removed but are purified into self-vision. 5. The third point, the matter of purifying consciousness. In Trecho you only see emptiness, but do not see the pure light visions, so the deluded vision cannot be removed or purified. You have to think that it is kettered or pure from the beginning, but it does not appear that way. It is therefore always linked with ignorance, and the visions are not completely pure. For this reason one can be easily distracted, and it is difficult to achieve liberation. In the Togal, however, you use methods for understanding illusion directly, so it makes the achieve in of self-liberation rapid. After self-liberation, d, looted vision does not occur and therefore does not cause distraction. The visions of Togal led very directly to understanding. Quote from the Yetra. There are eight objects of the eight consciousnesses, five senses with emotion, mind and kanzi. They are the self-vision bikinis and they spontaneously exist without any searching. Therefore this is called the great vision owner of wisdom. Fourth, the method to help others from the view, point that nothing exists inherently. The natural state spontaneously exists as sounds, rays and lights, and that Dahamakaya is permanent, but the Kayas are impermanent. But here the Dahamakaya has two divisions. We say that the Buddha's knowledge is purified but that it is impermanent. What is permanent is the nature of emptiness. The Buddha's mind is not permanent. Letton comments that in the Trecho, it is not easy to make pure visions, but in total one experiences the source of visions and their nature and how they are liberated. Therefore it is easier to purify all common objects and subjects. Trecho is like reading a description of the view instead of seeing the view itself. Those all appear. By the method of Togal you see this and so everything becomes rapidly purified. In Trecho, however, there is no direct method to see this. Trecho is also gradual it takes a long time. However, total is very direct and by itself can purify so that you can help other beings very quickly. Quote from the same text, all the visions come from themselves and are seen by themselves. Everything is the reflection from itself. There are no objects inherently. Everything is the great vision. Therefore there is no way to help others. Question. If you realize that everything is your own vision then how can you help other beings? What is the answer? The answer is that you can help them because they are self-vision. Six beings are also self-vision. Inherently helping them is not possible. Fifth, the matter of not searching for fruit. All of these matters are without any searching for fruit. During the Trecho time all the visions are inherent vision even though you understand that they have no inherent existence. Total allows the development of special vision that mixes with the normal vision so that it easily turns into the vision of reality. It is a quick and practical path to develop the self-liberated vision. 
nor do you need to. It is sometimes said that you only perceive your own karma. Letton comments that if you stop to help beings, that would imply that other beings are inherently real. But if you believe this you cannot help others in actuality. Helping beings is part of your own self-vision, within the natural state of spontaneous self-arising. Letton comments that visions still appear as inherently existent in Trecho even though you understand fully that they are all reflections that come from the natural state. So in Trecho the visions do not change they are the ordinary visions we all experience. You understand and they are self-liberated, but the visions do not change. Pray anymore. By this method you quickly achieve Buddhahood. 14. Letton comments that even though you understand that vision is self-created in Trecho, your visions are still mixed with deluded vision. Therefore you should practice TBGL and mix the Togol visions with the normal ones. The visions in Trecho are still waiting to be purified, so to reach Buddhahood by this method will take a long time. It is far quicker with Togol. Trecho is gradual. Quote from the Yetra. It is itself a great fruit, so there is nothing to search for. If you do not search for this fruit everything spontaneously exists. Therefore it is excellent. Sixth, the matter of directly seeing the self-visions. In total you directly see the self-vision. During the Trecho the six sense organs are not purified, and therefore they have to search for the purified visions. In the TTGL the doors of clear light are opened by the wisdom wind. From there the four lamps will appear and by them are purified all the views of delusion. According to this method, you understand that all visions are self, liberated visions while at the same time you are devil, epping the trecho view. 15. Letton comments that this view is of vision and unification. You cannot separate pure vision and unification, they develop at the same time. Quote from the Yetra. The point is to understand the means of self-vision so that there is nothing separable and it comes together. 7th, the matter of the BHUMIS, stages 16, Letton comments that literally BHUMI means earth, but here levels of mind is meant. The 10 BHUMIS represent the increasing capacity of developing knowledge. In Trecho everything is connected with the natural state, but the vision and body are unable to rise to the final level, because the method is lacking. In TTGL there are no antidotes to remove obscurations it naturally sends you to the final stage. Togol therefore achieves the great BHUMI of Swastika 11. Quote from the Yetra. This unchangeable BHUMI has no methods to remove all activities, so it is the greater way. The Swastika is the ancient symbol of Yundran, Atur, Nol, Ben. Letton comments that the BHUMIS referred to here are levels according to the Bonpur Prajna parameter. If you look at them panoramically they all seem to reflect one another. Each has its own beginning, object to be purified and knowledge to be achieved. At each stage there are different views and each BHUMI has its own deities. When you achieve the BHUMI you will see the divinity and they will teach you how to develop further. When you achieve the first BHUMI you see the loving goddess of Damde, give, in, the Sampurgakaya of the goddess of generosity. She will teach the antidote and how to remove the obscura, tyrants. The second is moral behavior Okshila. Higher levels form in like manner. The Bonpur philosophy has a background completely independent of the Indian and is much earlier. Later it found its way to India and the Indians accepted some of its concepts. An interesting example of this is the Kiasmo, logical system of Vazi Bandhu. His system has nothing in common with other Buddhist cosmological systems. And the Buddhists used to say that this system was his own special system. In fact it is almost identical to the Bonpur system. The root text of the Bonpo text is called the DZBPU, MDZO DPHUG, and is written in the Zanjung language with the Tibetan translation beneath it. It is still in use. How to practice the Togol from the Rigpa Jug, Rigpa Kuhu There comes the following quote concerning the practice of Togol. This is followed by a commentary. There is a proverb about the 42 methods of Togol. When the king of awareness travels magically to beings he rides on a red bird with a long beak that comes from the white step red rock, and riding on this bird he goes to the different places. At that time four kings are all serving him and lift him from down below. The four queens of the seasons are supporting him from the sides. Four magic winds are moving him along, and four great rivers are extending his virtues and magic. Four fires give equal heat. They dwell in the golden earth and eight clear mirrors decorate the body. Three secret letters are set into mind. 
Five bright lamps shine from the crown of the head. All the stars and planets are shining brightly on his breast. Four servants are all serving him. He works for beings without lacking any methods, and all benefits come from this mountain. This allegory are combined all the methods of the Togol practices. They were taught by the Dahomey to the Dukinis who kept them secret in this proverb. The early siddhas and scholars did not comment but thought to leave it to Shah Satashi Oilson for his share of comments. Lepin translates this as the awareness of the cuckoo though this is a different text from the famous Tanwang manuscript of the same name. The commentary the long big bird means the source of vision, the five rays of colored lights, the very beginning. In the center of the heart the awareness rests, and from the heart a channel the size of a straw joins the awareness to the lungs. Through this channel the winds are coming and going, and to them the visions attach. That produces thoughts. When the winds touch the source of the visions, that is called mind. The wind is like a blind horse and this mind is like a lame man with eyes who rides him. When the wind stops all the visions dissolve into awareness and all thoughts disappear and dissolve into their nature. This nature has three qualities emptiness, awareness and unification, or inseparability. That is the base from which the reflections come. If you use the methods of Togol, those reflections which the base contains spontaneously appear through the channel of the light which is joined to the eyes. Each eye has two channels joined to it. 17. Letton comments that one channel is the normal icon, Shesnus and the other is the one discussed here, so the doorway is the same although the Togol visions it narrow, ed internally. In Tibetan medicine this inner path is named the Yangji Karpo, Yangji Dkarpo. It travels between the eyeball and the lungs via the occipital foramen over the outside of the brain, and through it come the Togol visions. Normally it is not used until it is opened by the methods of Togol. In Trecho you still use the normal channels of the eye. This purifies the impure visions and you see the visions of wisdom. There are 42 methods of Togol and here they will be taught sequentially. The four kings that lift from beneath the four kings are the four methods. The first method concerns the body, speech and mind. The second con concerns the eye organ that stands at the doorway. The third is the object of vision and the fourth is to slow down the awareness and winds. For example, Ton Pashahinrad goes to the four great kings to invite them respectfully and he controls the three realms of existence. In the same way there are four methods to use and the awareness controls all the visions. The first method everybody, speech and mind the methods everybody the first method has three subdivisions. The body is kept in the posture to control the channels and winds. Controlling the posture helps the practitioner to see the clear light directly. This is why posture is important. Quote from the wonder for beads of gold, G-S-E-R-G-Y-I-P-H-R-E-N-G bad M-D-Z-D-S. The Dahomey posture is like a lion sit, ting, the Sampurgakai posture is like an elephant sit, ting, and the Manakai posture is like a Rishi sitting. The Dahomey posture. The posture of the lion sitting is to place the balls of the feet on the ground, lift the bottom and hold the back straight, and close the lower door, anus. The head is held back slightly and the two hands are placed on the ground between the legs. The position is like a squat. Some teachings say the whole foot should be placed on the ground but in our tradition only the front of it is put down. The purpose of this is to remove the wind that produces disturbing thoughts and to open the central channel so that visions start. Also it helps to stabilize the natural state. The Sampurgakaya posture. In the posture of the elephant lying down, you squat with the balls of your feet on the ground so that the knees are lifted up off the ground and touch the chest, and the chin is supported by the hands with the elbows on the ground. This calms the disturb, in winds, stops thoughts of desire or anger and brings strong health. This posture helps to bring complete visions externally and to stabilize the natural state. The Manakaya posture. The Rishi position has the soles of the feet placed on the ground with the arms wrapped round the knees, which touch the chest. The neck is slightly bent back. Alternatively you can sit without crossed legs, supporting the neck with the hands, with the head bent back. The purpose of this posture is to bring you warmth and gradually to stop the thoughts. It also allows you to develop external visions, while in turn all you develop great experiences. The postures are not to be held too strictly or held so tightly as to be uncomfortable, nor are they to be held too loosely. Too tight a position will be painful and disturb the meditation. Too loose a position will give no assistance. Then there is the posture like a duck moving side, 
correct ways, useful for beginners to start to have visions. To do this, the practitioner lies on the right side with the right elbow placed on the ground supporting the chin. The left hand is placed on the thigh. The two legs lie on the ground one on top of the other with the knees slightly bent. This inserts the wind into the central channel so that extraordinary visions develop. Finally, there is the antelope position which is not explained. 18. Letton comments that it is a very difficult position with the legs bent and the hands on the back of the neck looking up. These techniques are used to keep Kensantra, Tiwan and specifically to develop visions. In the bent system all the four classes of Tantra have their own postures as well. The methods of speech quote from the Takth Strengthener, R-T-A-G-S-T-S-H-A-D-S-G-R-O-N-R, from the Zngzungni Nayu. If you do not stop talking you cannot see the unspeakable nature and the one single point nature will not appear directly. Shadza comments that you must talk less, and in the end stop talking and remain in your nature. The methods of mind the mind means the essence of the awareness accord, into the gaze of why. To stare into space makes the movement of the winds calmer and calmer. When the winds become calm the unification will be deeper and deeper. Quote from the Taketh Strengthener. If you don't apply the gazes strictly, the awareness will not appear directly. The second method of the eye organ that stands at the doorway now the second method is with the eyes. In ordinary vision the gaze does not help with the appearance of wisdom. So you must hold special gazes in accordance with the body postures. Quote from the wonder for Bidzefgold. In the Dahamakaya body posture the eyes must gaze firmly upwards, for the Manakaya posture the gaze must be downwards and for the Sampurgakaya posture it must be to the side, right or left. 15. So the gazes can be of three types, but the main thing is the appearance of the visions. Letton comments that as with the body positions, these gazes are not to be held too tightly, otherwise one becomes uncomfortable and this disturbs the meditation. The essential thing is to control the mind. Quote from the same text, with half-closed eyes and without being deluded, one looks slightly below the sun at the distance of your fingers to your elbow. That is the method. Practice this more and more until you can keep look in at the sun in this way continuously. The third method of the object of vision the third method is for space. In a high place without any disturbance, gaze into the clean and clear sky. Gaze through the eyes at the clear cloudless sky, there will appear the different clear light visions. Beginner should do this at sunrise or at sunset. In the morning face west, and in the afternoon face east and gaze into the clear sky. Quote from the Tinshug, M-T-H-I-M-G Shog. In the morning gaze into the west. In the afternoon gaze east. The fourth method to slow down the winds and awareness. The fourth method gives four stages of breathing. Inhale, add a little, hold and exhale. Some teachers say this, but they do not know the method of breathing here. In this case, you should not change the breathing, but leave it as normal. Whether it is through the nose or mouth, keep it the same, as long as it is very gentle. If you keep this gentle breathing, then the thoughts and mind will be slowed down, and the mind will be easily seized as a prisoner, as the winds are not moving. The mind is kept prisoner by the awareness. If you keep the wind gentle, then the breath coming and going between the mouth and nose becomes calm, and when it becomes calm, then the mind and wind meet at the channel at the heart. As there is no disturbance, no thoughts are produced, and the mind is naturally absorbed into the naked nature. Four magical winds are moving him along there are four special channels. For example, the winds are all shaking and lifting the universe. In the same way, there are four great channels and all the visions of clarity are produced and developed, lifted, in them. Quote from the tick slash eat drug pack, thigla drug pa. In general four things combine to make that body. The channels or veins are like nets. In the body there are the four special channels of activity. The first is called the great golden channel Kautixma GRTSHN, the second the threads of white silk, Daddy KAR Snelma, the third is the fine twisted thread Fralar KHRUL, and the fourth the crystal tube, Shelbabkan. The first channel connects the heart to the central channel at the level of the heart. Inside there is the essential clear light, and there all the reflections spontaneously exist with the peaceful divinities. From there it travels to the brain, where the wrathful divinities spontaneously reside. Also it has branches which each support the visions of Tegel 17 inside the second channel, the threads of white silk, it is fine and white. This channel starts at the heart level of the central channel and goes up the spine, leaving the central channel at the neck. 
From there it travels over the outside of the brain where it splits into two branches. One side is connected to the right eye channel where it supports what we see as external vision. The other runs to the crown of the head where it supports the appearance of the great thoughtless aware. Letton comments that with regard to tegel, there are material tegel and natural tegel. The Tibetan for natural tegel means empty fight and awareness. Letton is translated into English as drop. Ness. When the vision is perfected, it supports the nine tegel that are piled up one on top of the other inside the channel. The third channel, the fine twisted thread, starts in the central channel at the level of the heart and then goes down to the base before rising again through the center of the four wheels, navel, heart, throat and crown kekras, to pass over the outside of the brain to the left eye doorway. It supports all the visions of the natural clear lights that shine directly. Finally the crystal tube travels from the heart to the eye. It supports the dissolving of all the visions into their nature. Thoughts are generated when the unification of the hard level meets the winds from the channel from the lungs. Four fires give equal heat. This refers to the four lamps. The lamp of water called Yangside, RGYANG R. The lamp of the empty table, the Eagleston Pass 7 SGRONR. The lamp of pure emptiness, DBYIMGS Mandagi SGRONR. And the lamp of self wisdom, Shazrap Rangbuni SGRONR. These four lamps produce the visions of the mandalas and the forms of the divinities, and whatever vision comes they are clear. Whatever vision comes all of them are equally encompassed with wisdom and the ripening of the three kayas. Thus, as in the proverb, the great fire of existence makes all warm equally and produces fruits and leaves on the bushes. This is the important teaching for insight into the natural state. Quote from the Ritpatselwam, X. The four lamps are all inner essential teachings. Commenting on the four lamps, first of all hold the body postures and eye positions as before. The first this is from one chapter of the Zungzuni Nayu, the section for teaching and initiation. Lamp, the lamp of water, appears when the eye gazes into clear space and a dark blue clear color appears one from this extend the colors of the five lights and rays of different shapes like the patterns of color that egg pair on the dark blue background of brocade silk. That is the beginning of the appearance of visions which exist spontaneously inside the heart. Quote from the text of Molten Gold, GSERE Azunma. In the external empty sky you will see the direct clear lights of the heart which are all blue, green, red, yellow, white and smoke colored. The teaching refers to the sky. Some commentators think that this refers to ordinary sky without clouds, but that is not correct, because the ordinary sky has nothing to do with the practitioner. 19. Letton comments that whether this vision the first dark blue vision comes or not depends on the quality of one's practice. It may appear in the sky but it has very much to do with the practitioner. The sky is just the base of the vision. The dark blue which appears to the practitioner never spontaneously exists in his or her nature when this method of posture and gazes is used. Quote from Wonderful Beats F. Gold. Into the external sky enters the lamp of internal space. Here is an explanation about external sky and internal space differently put. Normally the sky is not the base of TBG a rainbow vision. It just turns into a rainbow when supported by the practitioner's visions. However, you must not conclude from this distinction that external space and internal space are two kinds of things. 20. Letton comments that when the practitioner practices it the second and third lamps are the empty tegel and pure emptiness. They can be illustrated by a pond of water. If you throw a stone into a pond then ripples form around it. In the same way ripples come around the vision. At first they are without color, but finally they appear in five colors. That comes from the purification of the coarse wind. If you gaze into the vision then you will see inside. The awareness becomes more clear and suddenly there are no objects or subjects no grasp in and it nakedly appears. That is the lamp of self, wisdom. The fourth lamp is called the lamp of self-wisdom. That is explained as naked without any grasping of objects just left as it is. 3. If you have stabilized your looks to him or her as if space is changing, but ordinary space is not the basis of these visions. They come from within. Letton comments that here there is no grasping or focus, since it is very bright and clear to you. This is the nature of the trecho view, the inseparable nature, non-duality. This is the trecho view of naked nature. Without the trecho practices togol does not work at all. Without trecho, togol will not be effective. 
So you should not practice toggle alone, it should be practiced alongside trecho. If you abandon the trecho view, the visions of toggle will be of no more significance than watching the television better to go to the cinema. Vivid sense may happen, but if there is no understanding of illusion, the visions are of no value. Anybody can look into the sun and see visions and so forth, but it means nothing. Letton comments that this is again the trecho view. However, although in the DZO GCHEN view sounds, rays and light spontaneously exist, if you practice only trecho then what spontaneously exists will not be able to appear to you. That is why Togol makes the process of release from delusion so much quicker, since what spontaneously exists will appear to you. But its view is not different from the view of trecho. Lights, keeping in the natural state, then a very precise and clear knowledge will develop. This knowledge is much clearer than that which comes through studying. Indeed, whatever you say or teach comes without think, in your study it comes automatically. Everything is perfect and precise. That is called the cell, energy, of this nature. Clarity appears like pearls in golden threads. The nature is wisdom and forms like this are the cell of wisdom. Whatever visions you may have, these visions are all of the same nature and go back to the same truth. They are only distinguished by names. They dwell in the golden earth and eight clear mirrors decorate the body. This means that the basic empty nature is the place where the visions come from and go to. Both are in unification. The space is dark blue. From this dark blue space five colors all increase and appear. The real essence of awareness is inside the heart, but the forms and colors appear like a mala of beads through the eyes. 21. Again the normal eye sees nothing. The vision comes from the unification. When you are focusing on the sunlight you see threads, initially black or white. The two types of awareness are that of nature, the natural state, and the awareness of clarity, visions. In the earth everything is golden. You cannot find stones there all is gold. In the same way if everything is seen as reflections coming to or from the natural state then the visions are all seen truly like the empty nature, the unification. 22. There is nothing to take or remove. Everything has the visions are all whatever spontaneously exists with the unification. When these methods are practiced the visions are prepared to the practitioner. Four great rivers are extending his virtues and magic. The four great rivers are the four visions. Quote from the Trotral Rick Petzel Wam, Spros Brad Iric the initial text of the Zangjum Ninayu. The first is the direct vision that comes from emptiness. Then there is vision that is developing, then vision that is complete and finally vision that dissolves back into emptiness. 27. This is only a measure of how much you have practiced. You cannot compare these with the BHUMIS. The path of accumulation is like walking, whereas this is like flying in the sky. The first vision, the direct vision that comes from emptiness. The four methods of practicing, body, speech, mind and gaze, were mentioned previously. If you use these methods then from the heart kepka where the essence of the Buddha is, the natural state, the visions will come. When you begin to apply these four methods you will start to see rainbows and tail, and from the visions will start. Initially there will be many tail, sometimes piled up lip beads and sometimes side by side, moving all the time. Sometimes clear and sometimes not so clear. The reason for the visions is like the sun and its rays the unification is the real nature, but that is unsayable. The visions are like rays that appear to the practitioner, but not to the ordinary organs of sense perception. They are called the swastika tegel. They are same nature. Letton comments that these four stages are not progressive like Prajnaparamita or Tantric teachings with the four parts, which start with removal of obscurations, etc. Here, these visions are simply a reflection of how much you have practiced. There is no sense of purifying or developing under those to obscuration. Like the mirror and your face, your face is reflected in the mirror, but you cannot distinguish between the mirror and your reflection, both of them are the same. In the same way, whenever you have visions, you cannot split them from the unification. You must understand this. If you don't understand this, you will see the reflections as objects and understand yourself as the observed, in subject. The watcher and the watched are connected by thought, which is the mistake of grasping thought. By keeping to this method of practice all these visions are self-liberating. The sign of this is that they look like very fine beads, tail, moving in many angular patterns. In the corner of the angles there are small and fine tail. These visions are connected with the winds which is why they are always moving. 
You must not follow these visions, however, neither give them too much attention nor care for them. That means that whatever tale or visions come you have to be careful to see the visions without following them. You should remain in the natural state and not care what visions come. Quote from the Tohok Bets. There are two methods to use together in the daytime and in daylight use the sun and the fire crystal, magnifying glass, and in the night use the moonlight and the water crystal, natural crystal. In the early morning or late evening use the light of Bauta lamps. Whatever light you use, do not gaze at it directly. The visions will become more bright and clear and stable. Your contemplation becomes more and more stable. That means that your wings and mind become calmer and calmer. Then experiences will develop. Sud, then you will know the different knowledge without study. One third of wisdom will be yours. During this period, if you are disturbed by death, you will be born in Rangzin Trulpa, Rangbi Zhi and Sprulpa, the magically Emma, netted realms of the intermediate state. Quote from the Tatran Ma, R T A G S S G R O N R, that which is called the empty goes from the eyebrow level. If you have passed away, you will go to the magically emanated realms. This is not only for visions of the natural state, but also for the practice of contemplation. Therefore signs come of this type. Quote from the Tatran, R-T-A-G-S-S-G-R-O-N-G-B-U. Mixed with awareness and emptiness you will be born in the magically emanated realms. The second vision the vision that is developing. In the first vision, as the vision comes, you still practice and then the unification of nature comes. In this first stage if you practice in this way that visions come but they are not even sometimes bright and clear, sometimes dull, but they get more stable. Now in this second stage the unification occurs. It is called to separate from the eyebrow. This symbolizes the five wisdoms that appear as the five colors in rays that shoot straight upward from the eyebrow. They also go to the side and sometimes can even appear as a triangle. They are much more devil, ep than before and can seem even as large as a ken, tri. They are diaphanous like nets and have garlands of flowers, swastikas, jewels, palaces and mandalas. Many shapes can come. This is called the space visions arriving in the sky. One can also see Jordan, arrows and many other forms. That is the completion of nearly perfect visions. Between the visions, there are bigger tegel. Their size is like shields which are round with five colors 28 that is called compounding the essence of awareness. Letton comments that these visions can occur within Tegel or outside them. Tegel can also appear on their own. All the stars and planets are shining brightly on his breast. This is explained by the comments on vision above. These visions all become stable according to the extent of practice. First they fly past like a hawk flying through the sky. At the second stage like deer running on the mountains. For the third stage like a shaharana, a slow, moving mythological animal. At the fourth stage they are slow and gentle like the honeybees taking pollen from the flowers. Their stability depends on how much you have practiced contemplation. The visions are as stable as your contemplation. In the final stage the visions are as big as the universe and stable, and at the same time the contemplation is stable. When you start to have them, there are also techniques for changing the gazes according to how the visions appear. Quote from the Zengzhuni Nayu. When the Vitseng comes as a semicircle and white you should gaze upward and as hard as possible. When the colors are above and to the right and red you should look down. When the visions come in square shapes yellow in color, the gaze is to the right. When they are round and green then look to the left. If the shapes are triangular and the colors are blue the eye should gaze straight ahead. These are general instructions but the visions change so much that you should learn by experience. If you don't develop the visions at all even though you practice, it is sometimes helpful to press on the eyes and hold the breath. Then suddenly open your eyes and exhale the breath, and the visions will appear temporarily. This may be necessary at the beginning. After they have gone just keep the natural state without any distraction. Sometimes if you are unable to control your thoughts then you should stop for a little while and calm the breath gently. The gazes also help to calm the thoughts. Your contemplation is never deluded if you are in the natural state, so whether the visions develop or not, the mind should remain in contemplation in the natural state, always. The gazes can help to get into the natural state, but the mind is the central key. 30. It is important that your gazes are held looking into space and that you remain in awareness without distraction and with calm breath. 31. Conversely, if you don't practice the natural state you can have some visions, but they are still not free. 
But then if the visions distract you from remaining in the natural state, that is again not right. If you stay continuously in the natural state without visions then you do not understand the deluded vision, so you need both techniques. This is not like a game you play for interest, neither should you become attached to these visions and grasp after them. They are for practice. It is the same for dark retreat. You can have interesting experiences but they do not make much sense on their own. Letton comments that you should practice and discover what works for you after all it is you that must enter the natural state. Letton comments that this is a basic instruction for all of the time. If you remain in the natural state then the visions come. Do not follow the visions, however, you should not be distracted by them. There are three techniques in the Zanjhumni neither gazes of the dark, of space and of light. The first is not described in this text, which only mentions the gazes of space and light. The practice of the dark is used to stabilize contemplation and for the initial development of visions. At the beginning the visions start from inside the tail, so only an upper half or a lower half appears, and not very clear. At this time you must still hold your gaze straight ahead in the natural state. 23. Letton comments that if you look for the other half of the image nothing will remain they will all go. Better not to try to see anything. If you keep in the natural state then they will come naturally, for that is their source. But if you want to see more and try to focus on them, they will not remain. They are not objects of vision. This is generally true, but there are other qualifications. If you pass away when you are at the stage of the uniting of the four visions of wisdom, then in the same way in the intermediate state there are four visions of wisdom. At that time you will realize and be liberated. If you pass away when you see the triangle shapes in your vision then in the intermediate state you will be liberated. If the visions are round and like four petal flowers when you pass away, you will realize the clear vision in the first part of the intermediate state. In conclusion, if all the colors and the shapes are completed at the time you pass away, then when you are in the intermediate state you will realize what all the visions are before the bardo of birth, the Ipa bardo, Zripe bardo, and you will be liberated. 24. Letton comments that this is a commentary on the Zanjunimayu text called the Six Lumps. If in this time you pass away you will be liberated in the intermediate state, because at the start of the bardo, visions begin as in this practice. If you realize that these visions are spontane, outly arisen from the natural state then you will be labor, ed, since you will not grasp after them as real. This is explained in book 4 of this text. When the tail of the size of shields and round then the visions have almost come to the ultimate. They do not get bigger than this. Each has five colors around the outside with mandalas of divinities with the consorts and different attendants inside. This is almost the final vision. The third vision. Now comes complete vision. These visions all spontaneously exist within the natural state and you have used methods to develop them, so the visions appear to you. The visions do not come from outside. When the visions are all complete, then peace, full and wrathful divinities will appear not as statues, but directly from the natural state in Sambhagakaya on Menakaya forms. Each will have the 32 spare keel marks and 81 subsidiary signs. They appear because the practitioner has reached the complete vision. Just using the methods of TTGL and Trecho and without any visualization or mantra the divinities appear. Therefore it is excellent. Whatever the visions might be called, their nature is unification. They come to vision although they spontaneously exist. It is you that has come into the natural state, not them. You should not be limited by what visions come. Single or with consorts, to keen is peaceful or wrathful they appear because you have practiced in unification and are stable and clear. Therefore these visions come to you. There can be retinues and attendants and mandalas and so on, each with decorations and ornaments. They are naturally come in because everything spontaneously exists. You did not make any special thing, you only used the methods. Quote from the Tokp. The signs are the rays of clarity and the decorations of images. Five bright lamps shine from the crown of head when the completed visions come the five wisdoms directly appear to the practitioner. At the same time all the visions mix with the external vision. Real vision mixes with external vision so that it is the same vision for you the material things now mix with your vision. At the same time the visions are all liberating themselves. So the empty wisdom has appeared to you, and whatever you see, wisdom appears. It does not matter whether you see friends or enemies all are liberated in your vision. The visions are completely mixed without any conditions. 
All the normal visions in life are seen as the Buddha realms and the five Buddha families. You can see coming from your chest the five colored rays connecting you to these divinities. Also from your eyebrows rays come with tail between them, becoming like the mandalas of the 86 wrathful deities, and inside the heart there are the 45 peaceful deities that you can see. The channels become completely purified and through them divinities and beings appear. At this time all the normal thoughts which are mixed with ignorance are completely purified and liberated. Awareness and wisdoms directly appear. At that time you can focus on rocks and move them if you want to. Your mind can make imprints in rock. There is no attachment with the material body. Also the practitioner has the six kinds of clear voice and can see all the mountains as a paradise of the divinities. You can receive teachings from them and you have much knell, edge that you receive without any learning. The material body and channels being self-liberated, material things start to disappear. The mind and physical body are disconnected, so the physical body begins to disappear. You can see samsara and nirvana. You can see samsara and see that it is not your karmic cause, and you can see nirvana and that it is connected to you. All the karmic causes and traces disappear like shoot, in stars disappearing into space. All the three kayas are completed in this time. Three letters are set into his mind all the visions and manakyas that have knowledge and purifications appear to the practitioner. This is a result of the practice of Dzogchen. No other schools can do this. To practice, see and use all the three kayas is unique to Dzogchen. Therefore Dzogchen is the most esoteric path. In the practice of the eight ways, the realization of the three kayas comes after the tremina, tiwin of the path, in the intermediate state. Here, they appear during this life so one can practice and have teachings directly from them. Some of the masters say that these visions are all delusion. And some say this is the final truth. According to this text and my intention, you cannot say this is either delusion or truth. What appears is what spontaneously exists you cannot say that it is either true or false. To the practitioner the natural state appears spontaneously but the visions are neither external nor material. In the experience of the practitioner who has achieved this state all the visions are liberated into the natural state. The fourth vision. The fourth vision is the completion of the natural visions. Here, depending on the methods which you have used, the visions of the natural state are fully developed. They are like the full moon. Just as when the moon is full it begins to wane, in the same way the visions also wane. They come down to the size of tegel again and the tegel dissolve into the natural state so that all that remains is the unification, nothing else. For this reason it is called finished. Vision remains in the natural state as the final truth, just as the 30th day of the lunar month of the Tibetan calendar has no moon that you can see. 25. Letton comments that they start from the natural state and go back to the same source. The visions are bigger or smaller depending on the practitioner. The natural state is neither it is always the same nature and is without size or color. There are two ways in which this completion comes about gradual and sudden. In the gradual case the visions become full and then gradually diminish. Here the practitioner develops the four lamps sequentially and then the visions gradually disappear. Although it is very rare, there are practitioners who are purified from practice in a previous life, and for them the visions suddenly start and equally suddenly stop. After the visions are complete all aspects of experience dissolve at the same time not only the visions that you have, but also the normal vision, body and mind, sense organs and consciousness. Everything dissolves into your nature. Because all aspects have been purified 35 Lepton comments that this is why after the taking of the body of light jaw slashes, the nails and hair are left you can cut them and it does not hurt, which indicates that they are outside the connection to the nature. 20 nails and some pieces of hair are left. One of Sharps's masters called Doradot Pa ZLA Baragraxpa did achieve the complete resorption of his body in 1932. He asked his pupils to build a hut so he could take the rainbow body, and he asked them to keep its location secret especially from his very powerful brother who only lived one day away, because otherwise he would be disturbed. They built a hut, and they kept a small hole in it for a few days and then closed it completely. Just before he entered he took only a little milk and then nothing at all. It is said in the period just before he entered that sometimes he disappeared completely to the eyes of his students. 
Then he entered the hut, and around it they heard chanting and singing and saw rainbows of extraordinary shape, including square and linear ones. After one week they informed his brother, who was very upset that he had not been told. He traveled rapidly to the place and fought with the pupils and broke down the hut. This was nine days after Dore Jukpa had entered it. When the brother looked inside it looked as though Dore was there and he loudly exclaimed, Everybody says you are dead but you are not dead. So he shook the robes, but there was nothing only the empty clothes that Dore was wearing, which fell to the ground. Searching for relics, he found some hair and nineteen nails, but could not find the twentieth. At that time Dore's main student was not there either, and when he heard he made prostrations all the way to the place. He reached the hut where Dore had disappeared and, searching for remnants of his master, found the missing why is it that all the external visions are dissolved? The reason for this lies in the process of awareness, which is generated at the heart by the arrival of winds from the channel that comes from the lungs. At the end of the visions this channel is completely disconnected and so the natural state becomes complete and pure 36, therefore all the visions are dissolved and this nature comes into the real final source 37 if it does not reach fingernail. This can be seen to this day and age. When Shah died in 1935 he left behind a body no larger than a plate. Partial resorption of the body was also achieved by his nephew and his successor. The most recent case was that of four students, one of whom was a personal friend of the Lepin, who went to practice with one of Sharpe's main students in the 1950s. When the Cultural Revolution came they were brutalized along with all the monks. One died at this period and achieved the partial absorption of the elements of his body. The remaining pair lived on until after Mao died. One of them gave teachings to many people during the period of religious liberalization that followed, and when he died in 1983 he also very nearly disappeared. Two of the monks who reside in Kathmandu were present at the time, as is described in Appendix I of this book. Partial resorption of the body is simply the result of the stage of practice reached at the end of the life. Letton comments that just as the beginning of this process could be described as being like traveling down the engineer, Lish Channel, at this stage the traveler has reached the open ocean and sees the shore no longer. Letton comments that this is not as a fall external vision had disappeared and the practitioner were unable to see anyone or anything. The vision that dissolves is that connected to one's own personal traces, that is, the practitioner never can see other beings and things that are part of the shared karmic traces but not his or her own. No thoughts can delude. Were one to look into a mirror one would be invisible. Indeed, others can sometimes see the practitioner, nah, sometimes not. It depends on the depth of absorption the final nature then a small body is left behind because the visions have not all dissolved. The two results at the time the practitioner receives two kinds of things. First of all he or she receives the free birth, this is explained below, and helps beings. The visions start to dissolve and when the practitioner looks at the fingers on the hands, he or she sees all the fingers wrapped up with lights. When the practitioner focuses on these lights and remains in meditation the body disappears and at the same time he or she sees the universe like the reflection of the moon in water. Also the practitioner can look at his or her own body and see that it too is like a reflection in a mirror. The time is called the great transfer. The practitioner then becomes a member of the lineage of those who made the great transfer like the first 24 masters of the DZOGCHEN lineage 38 he or she then belongs to their community. And when he or she has a body like this, impure eyes see the practitioner as a normal person but he or she has a light body, hence the free birth. In his or her body there is nothing material. The body can completely disappear or go through solid walls or fly in the air. An example is Tapiritse who after he took a rainbow body was able to appear in any form at any time. In the Zanjum Nino it tells of him appearing to a rich man as a servant. This is because the man was the benefactor of into the natural state. This refers to the lineage of the Zanjum Nino. It was orally transmitted from master to pupil for 24 generations, with all lineage holders achieving the great transfer. The 25th master, Tapiritse, Tarpai Hrizaya, Asked his pupil Nenkhlepa, Snenkhlepa, in the 8th century to write it down, and many other rain, both bodies were recorded in the subsequent written line, age. It has remained unbroken to this day. Nenkhlepa, who was meditating nearby. 
After some time they realized that the servant was an emanated form, and Tapiritse taught both the rich donor and Nengkalepa, finally appearing as the crystal kernel, or form of the Dharmakaya. Another example was Lungbon Lanyun Lungben L.A. Chanyeri, who lived in the 12th century in the Tosan Prev, Ince, who prayed for a long time to go to Tselwang Riding, T-S-H-E-D-V-A-N-G-R-I-G-D-Z-I-N. One day Tselwang Riding appeared to him and then agreed to teach him. In fact more than one person received these teachings, which included the Namkatru Dzodize Doji Chie and that is quoted above. The practitioner can meet an ordinary person and talk and then disappear and reappear at any time. He or she can also help all the six realms of beings at that time. If the connections are already there the practitioner can insert his or her mind into that of a pupil and change the pupil's mind. Gradually the pupils will practice and take their own rainbow bodies. That is the first result. 26. Letton comments that such appearances are rare in our days. Now people are not connected, that is to say that there must be a karmic cause on the part of the practitioner and a commitment from the master for such an appearance to happen. The second result is called gaining free entrance. This means that if the practitioner has a bodily form which is not great or powerful in helping beings then when he or she sees his or her fingers wrapped with life there is no need to focus on them. The practitioner just remains in the unification. Soon thereafter the practitioner will completely disappear and all will disappear for him or her. Only the unification exists. This is called all the visions go back to the natural state. 27. Letton comments that sometimes this is explained by analogy to an image that is placed inside an offering vessel. You cannot see the image from the outside of the vessel although inside it is there. In the same way, although the, then the practitioner disappears and takes a rainbow body and, with the Buddhas, helps beings until samsara is finished. This is explained in the text Treasure of Emptiness written by Shada, where it is described in detail 41 and the queens of the four seasons are all supporting him that means the four supports are by his side. They are described in the following text. Quote from the text of Molten Gold Exvajiyajun Ma, there are four supports. The first is the three one move, able bases. The second is the three stabilities. The third is to fix as if with nails the three receipts, and the fourth is to show the signs of liberation and the four satisfactions. The first support is the three unmovable bases. This is first to keep your body posture as stable as possible, so that your channels and winds all become calm. The second aspect is to not shift the gazes. This allows the visions to develop much more quickly. The third is to hold the mind without speaking in the natural state, which makes the unification more stable. The second support is the three stabilities. The first stable, it is that your body has no activity. The second is that if you stay quiet, without acting, then your winds all become calm and self-liberating. When the winds be, come calm the mind is not disturbed with thoughts. The third is that if the winds are not agitated with thoughts then the visions are all stable and they all quickly be come developed and complete. Visions dissolve, something is there. The practitioner spontaneously exists in the unification. Although this analogy is often used it can be misleading it must be remain, bet that the unification has neither inside nor outside. Shadza was the prolific author of more than 14 volumes of over 300 pages each. The third support is to fix as with nails the three receipts. During this time the signs of how much you have practiced come to the three doorways of body, speech and mind. How much you have achieved is also shown by dreams. The first signs come to the doorway of the body. It will feel like a tortoise put on a plate, unmoving in its shell. If you do this with the body then the channels and winds will be calm that is the natural system. When the great perfection does not stop action 42 the lamps are fixed as with nails. So if you do this then all the bodily activities are liberated, and without acting the unification and awareness become more clear. This is the part of the body. The second doorway is the speech. It is like drum, meaning that does not cease. If you do not stop speaking then the mind goes into the channels and disturbs your keeping in the nature. If you stop talking no winds go through the channels and the unutterable nature is more clear and stable. You are more stable in unification and awareness. The third doorway is the mind. It is like a bird caught in a tether trap. When all the thoughts and activities become naturally liberated then unification and awareness become clear and stable. 
and that makes all the visions unmixed and pure. Impure visions disappear and pure visions are stable and clear. During the time that visions are developing the practitioner is like a very sick man who loses all shame regarding others. The practitioner who receives this sign does not care anymore whether he or she is washed or not one disregards one's appearance. So the practitioner cares for nothing. The reason is that the winds are inserted into the central channel and everything is controlled by the natural state. All the world of convention bounded by thoughts is no longer relevant. All thoughts this means that if your body is stable and does not move, naturally your lamps will not move. Are inserted into the natural state. It is called without acting to put to the body. Soon thereafter the practitioner, Nas body will be liberated into the natural state and all the three kinds will appear through the wisdom of the natural state. Second, the practitioner's speech is like that of a mad man and he or she does not care. The practitioner has liberated all the thoughts and is not bound by thoughts, so the speech is not bounded. Thus the nail of the unsayable is fixed to the speech. For such a practitioner the awareness and unification is very clear and he or she is completely controlled by that. There is no thought of what other people think. Third, the practitioner's mind is like that of a man who has been poisoned he has no control. The prakti, Tivana is completely controlled by his or her awareness and everything spontaneously comes without any plan, Ning. All the thoughts are self-liberating. That is the nail without thoughts that fixes to the thoughts. The fourth support the signs of liberation. The signs of liberation are given in two parts. First there is the time of completion, in which the visions become complete. All things are liberated and all the visions become complete. Like the elephant who gets into the mud in the middle of the rice field, they will come out nigh themselves. The practitioner does not need any special practice. That is called without any stopping. The result is that the wisdom of the activities will be controlled so whatever the practitioner says is sweet to those who hear his or her voice. The speech has been controlled with awareness, and compassion automatically appears. All that he or she speaks becomes teachings and they will be deep and clear. The mind is like a man who once had smallpox after he has recovered it never comes back. In the same way when the practitioner has liberated all thought, then obscuring thoughts never return. The practitioner is controlled by wisdom and awareness. This sign is called the nails without thoughts fix the remem, bearing thoughts 43. The second sign of liberation has four divisions. Here everything is one. All the visions are one and during that time the practitioner's body is like a corpse. Whatever he or she eats or whatever happens he or she does not care that is the feeling of the body. This means that the mind is completely liberated into the unification and clarity. The practitioner is without fear. Thus without fear the nail fixes without focusing. For example, if the practitioner is surrounded by enemies he or she is not frightened. That is the sign that all the thoughts are liberated into the unchangeable unification. The practitioner's speech is like echoes in the rugs. Whatever others say he or she just repeats, for there is no plan to say anything. This sign shows that all the syllables that normally exist in the channels are liberated into the unification, so the nail of the unsayable pins the thoughts and everything is bright, clear and natural. The practitioner's mind is like a mist that dis appears into space there is no trace of where it is liberated or where it has gone. All that remains is the unification and the liberated wisdom without delusion. Wisdom shines brightly to him or her. These signs come to the practitioner who has achieved the visions. The practitioner has received four initiations. For the four signs of the body he or she has received the four initiations of the base. Secondly he or she has received the four initiations of the path. Finally in the mind he or she has received the four initiations of the fruit. That is the sign of liberation. Recognizing the degree of achievement through dreams. Achievement comes according to the practitioner's determination to practice. The best practitioner stops all dream vision and does not care or learn from them. The dreams are liberated into the clear light. This is the sign Latin comments that means that all thoughts disappear. That he or she will take a rainbow body during this lifetime. The practitioner of second capacity recognizes the dream visions as dream and controls them. When he or she is able to do this liberation will be achieved during the intermediate state. The third capacity of practitioner has stopped the bad karmic causes of dreams and always has good dreams. He or she will be reborn in the magically emanated realms.
Quote from the text of Molten Gold, the practitioner has received the empowerment of the visions. By this all the visions of secondary causes are the support for the practice. Also he or she has received the empowerment of the body. By this all material things disappear and only clear lights remain. He or she receives the empowerment of the secret mind and wind. By this all thoughts are liberated into the natural state. The four satisfactions. The first satisfaction is that whether the practitioner hears all the teaching of the Buddhas or not, he or she is neither happy nor sad. The practitioner never expects to hear it or to see it because he or she realizes completely that the Buddha is not far from his or her unification that is known. The second is that the practitioner neither wishes nor doubts. The third satisfaction is that when he or she sees that the lower realms of existence have so much suffering, the practitioner does not fear it. He or she does not wish or pray not to be reborn there because the natural state has been completely achieved. The fourth is that the practitioner will never roam in samsara. There is nothing left of his or her vision to be born or bring suffering. Four servants are all serving him. These are the four wisdoms. The first is the ability to distinguish clearly, intellect. All existences do not mix, therefore they are clearly distinguished. These are emanated by him in the intermediate state. The second is the ability to know how things are related. The practitioner sees how all existence is connected with awareness. The third is the conception of how things are liberated. The practitioner sees that all existences are liberated into the natural state. The fourth is called the ultimate nature of things. The practitioner sees that all that exists is sent entirely to the pure natural state. Nothing exists beyond this nature. This completes the 42 methods of Togol Prak, Tice. All the impure visions are liberated into pure nature. The practitioner comes to the permanent place and there is no doubt that he or she will never depart from there. Beck for Fair and Bardo practices Tibetan text 46b, line 6 the third category of essential teachings for the practice the traveler who crosses the mountains and having mistaken his way is helped to find the right path these are the teachings for liberation during the Bardo intended for the practitioner of medium capacity. This teaching has three subdivisions, namely the teachings for the intermediate state of life, the instructions just before the moment of death and the instructions of emptiness. One Latin comments that this section is for those who have not practiced during their lifetime and who therefore have to depend on Bardo teachings. The teachings for the intermediate state all the beings within what spontaneously exists possess two types of layer two, for example, a mirror automat, equally collects crime, even though no one puts dirt on it. In the same way, if you have not purified all the tough and subtle causes then those previous karmic traces that you have collected become the seeds for future karmic actions. You have collected many causes and so, without being able to choose, you take birth in the six realms of sentient beings and experience the feelings of happiness, suffering or neutral emotions. These traces have the power to do this. When karmic traces are mixed with consciousness it is called deluded consciousness. Human beings in particular are bounded by the five aggregates three these five limit human experience so we are completely restricted. Thus we don't see the visions of the five Buddha bodies for so this limitation of the five aggregates and the five consciousnesses restricts our experience and covers the vision of the pure lights. Also we are bound by the emotions and karmic causes. By this the vision of nification, wisdom and emptiness is covered. We are always taking and collecting deluded visions and being bound by them. By this cause we circulate for innumerable lives in samsara. Letton comments that this refers to basic alaya, which is consciousness and those karmic traces dependent on consciousness. These are body, mind, perceptions, emotions and sense organs. Other realms have fewer skandhas. For example, the demigods and gods are not bounded by body. Dahamekaya, Sambhagakaya, Manakaya, Nature Body and Perfection Body. Because we always have these sufferings and miseries we begin to search for Nirvana, wanting to be released from these fetters. One who raises this intention must from the beginning listen to and learn the right teachings. In the second place what is learned must be practiced with contemplation. Finally what has been practiced should give fruit. During this life you must do this, or without any doubt you will remain trapped by Sam, Sarah. This is the purpose of a worthwhile life. Quote from the text of Molten Gold, During the bardo of normal life you must learn and practice. 
the teaching for the period just before death. Now there are three capacities of practitioner. The first dies like a child dying, the second like an old dog dying and the third like a king dying. For the first, there is no worry about whether one is alive or dying, just as a young child does not know whether it wants to be alive or die. For the second, there are further two subdivisions. The first is like a dog who has not prepared for death, but when it realizes it is dying, runs from the crowds of people and lies down beside the road outside the town. The second is like a dog who when it realizes it is going to die makes time to go away for a long distance to find a cave or an empty valley where it is certain to be undisturbed. Letton comments that it does not say to go directly into meditation after having only heard a few teachings you must learn and understand first. This is like when the fifth Dalai Lama rebuked the Kagyupa order of Tibetan Buddhism on the grounds that there was no learning, only practice for siddhas in their monastic syllabus. Indeed it was said of those days that half of Tibet were beggars and most of them were siddhas. The third is like the king dying. When he is sick everybody is trying to cure him with medicines and pujas, and after his death all the relatives surround him and shed tears for him and hear his will. Then the people make prayers for 49 days, and there is an elaborate funeral with a large gathering. This kind of death is for a person who shows the sign of not being a real DZOGPACHENPO practitioner. That is the way of death for ordinary beings. The real practitioner, who has visions and experience with wisdom and clear light, chooses the right body posture for death. This is the lion lying down. The mind is transferred through the eye and mixes with the unification without any extending and conclusion. One just remains there in the natural state and takes death without any distractions. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. It is important to remember not to be deluded but to be in the natural state just before taking death, which will stop all the elements 7. The best way is to remain in the unification of clear light. If the practitioner does this then the practice and experience will all help to send him or her to the visions of the intermediate state. The practice will send or the visions of the intermediate state will receive, so one is able to be liberated in a moment. Letton comments that this is like the posture of the Sheikh, Yemeni's pairing of honor seen in statues. Letton comments that this refers to the fact that our body is connected with five elements, each supporting the mind. When the elements disconnect the mind starts to lose its support, then the body, having no connection with mind, no longer works. It becomes like a corpse or rock. The essential teaching for this purpose from now on you should always practice the gazes in clear space and remain united with your nature without distraction. Sometimes you should think that when you die you will mix only with the unification. That you must practice during this lifetime. From time to time think this way while you maintain, in the gazes in clear space, then breathe out strongly and hold your contemplation in the unification. That is my essential teaching. In this case, without depending on the teachings, one can keep faith with one's master and friends. They must remind one to keep in the nature. If one realizes that one is ready to stop connection with the elements one can eject the mind by saying HIK 21 times. This practice is part of Fower, 8 so there are two things one can do. Best of all is not to distract the departing person from meditation or do anything. It is only if he or she is unable to remain continuously in the natural state that this must be done. In this case, one should visualize the mind as the letter R inside the central channel at the hard level. Each time one says HIK, the letter R rises the width of a thumb until it leaves the crown of the head, at which point it is liberated into space. In the Magyu, Maya Gyud, there is a teaching of Fao in three stages Fao for the Dahamakaya, Sampurgakaya and Manakaya. In this case, one should have experience with the Sampurgakaya transference. Quite often in Tantric teaching there is the description of the discon, action of the elements one from another. If one is not this is the practice of the transference of consciousness, which is described in the text that follows. The Magu is the teachings of the highest Tantra within the Bonpo tradition and is thus a very important text. Dependent on gradual disconnection of the elements from the mind, one can transfer to Nirvana. Another type of practitioner is one who has received detailed teachings on DZOGCHEM, but has not practiced them very well. In this case, one has to depend on various ways of dying according to the disconnection of the elements from the mind. There are four external elements and five internal descriptions of sky and five different secret energies. Altogether there are twenty lifting winds which are gradually dissolved. 
the process of their dissolution Sharjah commented on in detail in the full two-volume text of which this is a condensed summary. The disconnection of hell limits here is the very simple explanation of how the mind is disconnected at the time of death. First a quote from the text of Molten Gold. When the earth element dissolves into earth and is disconnected with mind, the sign will be that the body feels very heavy, and although the person may be hungry he or she is unable to eat or stand up or move. When the water element dissolves into water and is disconnected with mind the sign is that the person cannot keep water and it flows from the mouth, nose and eyes. When the fire element is disconnected with mind and dissolves into fire the body begins to get cold starting from the feet and moving to the center. And when the wind element dissolves into wind and is disconnected with mind the person makes a sound automatically and the limbs move involuntarily. During this time the eyes roll up and that is the sign that death has come. If the person has received teachings previously then somebody must remind him or her. Then in all the branches of the channels and veins the blood comes back to the heart. This blood makes three drops inside the heart where there is a hollow, and three exhalations occur. That is the final breathing. At that time the drop of semen received from the father comes down from the crown to the heart in the central channel, and the drop of blood received from the mother comes up from the solar plexus to the heart in like manner. The dying person sees first a bright white light and then a bright red light. When the two drops meet in the center of the heart everything goes dark and again, shastness occurs for an uncertain length of time. The good practitioner who stays in the natural state, if very accomplished, can remember the natural state during this time, but it is very difficult. The length of the time of unconsciousness depends on many conditions, but afterward the person awakens with a very clear awareness. If one has received these teachings and has realized the natural state then one will be in the natural state like a clear light in a cloudless sky, with no slash or visions appearing. It is very important to realize that this happens to all beings after death. They are all there for a long or short time, although it is not sure how long it will be for any particular individual. But the realization of it depends on them. If one realizes one's presence during this time and realizes the natural state then one will surely obtain Buddhahood. Quote from the Golden Spoon, G-S-E-R-G-Y-I Thermi, that is the time of the separation of wisdom and mind. If one who has practiced realizes this here then he or she will surely become Buddha, and once one has entered this state one will never come back to Samsara. Imaho, wonderful. The Bhadu visions the time of clear vision is called the Boni, Ben Yid, Bhadu of emptiness. If one is not liberated during this time when the natural state appears clearly, then one starts to have basic visions of the clear light. There appear five very bright colors. If you realize that this is your own vision of this time then it is also possible to be liberated. Quote from the Yangtze, Yangtze, awareness comes out from the eyes, and disappears into space and clear light vision comes. That is the time for one who has received teachings and practiced them to be liberated. If one is not liberated in this time then another state occurs, called united with the clear light. Previously one had visions. Now they develop much more and one sees the bodies of the Buddhas and hears sounds and sees lights and rays. If one has practiced there can be many visions of divinities and forms. Quote from the fourth section of the Zanjhumni Nayu, the Zeb, GZER Bu. The light becomes like realms of unlimited divinities clear as rainbow shin, in in the sky and very loud sounds sound as if they're in empty space, like echoes. They come from within themselves without stopping, like dragons roaring. The shapes of the rays are various, like open brocade. The practitioner who has experienced these previously will see the Buddha realms and all the Buddhas there. In this time one sees rays from one's chest connecting to the Buddhas. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. Inside the heart the clear light shines, in a tail, the size of a thumb. The visions are connected with Buddhas from there. You have to keep in the nature without delusion. For the practitioner who realizes that the visions are all his own visions, then these visions are called the awareness is entered to the light. Automatically one can enter the natural state without thought. Then all the visions dissolve into the rays coming from one's chest, that is called the light dissolved into awareness. If one realizes that the visions are all one's own nature, one will liberate it into the natural state. If one does not keep this vision and cannot be led by into nature then the next stage is called unification and dissolves into wisdom. At this time the vision comes from one's chest and fine light rays rise into the sky. 
The practitioner looks through the rays, and they become more extended with five colors and visions. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. When one has visions that one's body is light, the five wisdoms can be seen as the five colors, and it is important to realize the natural state. The five lights are blue, white, yellow and red. These four are not separate but fine and clear. Each of these colors and rays have taken at their end accord into the color of the rays. Their size is like mirrors and they are ringed with the five colors. On the top of these tail, there are many colored lights around like a pea, cock's feather. That is called the visions of the four wisdoms united. The text quoted above says four, but it should be five colors. The five wisdoms are all colored and completed. If at this point the practitioner does not realize that these visions are all self-created visions then the wisdoms dissolve into what spontaneously exists. They dissolve round the lights and the lights extend and become like the clear sky. Under the wrathful deities appear complete with their retinues. All the peaceful divinities with their retinues are completed and all the six realms of beings with the six Buddhas emanated by Tom Pashahinrad can be seen. They are not far from the natural state, and therefore this is called the vision of the base. 28. Letton comments that this is called Zedogchenzitro, but is a naturally appearing vision, not a visualization. In the practice of Zitro, Zukhro, 86 wrathful and 40, 5 peaceful Buddhas are seen with the 6 realms of beings, emanated by the 6 Buddhas. The eight visions after the visions of the peaceful and wrathful deities connected to one's chest, there are three stages. First, eight visions come. The first is named the vision of compassion. The second is the vision of light. The third is vision of chiasm. The fourth is the vision of wisdom. The fifth is the vision of unification and the sixth is the vision of unending liberation. The seventh is the vision of the impure and finally comes the pure vision. The vision of compassion. This means that one suddenly has compassion for samsara and nirvana, equally there is no preference. The vision of light. One sees that the visions are all from inside one's nature they spontaneously exist 12 the vision of the kayas. One sees that the visions cannot change one, whether they are wrathful or peaceful does not matter. The vision of wisdom. This means that the visions cannot be stopped because they are recognized as not material. Stay in the bardo for two weeks, then in the first week you're in your old body, and in the second week you feel like the new body you will be reborn into. The time you're in the bardo depends on your candy, two and seven weeks is an average. But the situation is just the same as dream. There is a story of a man who died and roamed in the bardo. He went back to his family and no one answered him. He was very upset, as he thought that everyone was avoiding him for some reason. It was only when he saw his body being cremated that he realized he was dead. Letton comments that the extent of these visions depends on the practitioner. For one who has not practiced, only the impure vision is seen. Letton comments that is like the image inside the offering vessel used earlier to explain the body of light. The vision of unification. This means that in one's consciousness one controls wherever one wants to focus on without any delusion. The vision of unending liberation. All the visions are liberated into the natural state. The visions of the impure. All the six realms of beings come into vision. The pure visions. Now one can reach the pure state. The eight visions are called the pure visions. The wisdom is connected with mother and son. One here Lepin explains that the normal visions are impure and the togol visions are pure. In this text it is said that the impure visions are the visions of the six realms of beings. Pure visions are like the visions of divinities, man, Dals, etc. But in these visions of Togol the quality is the same whatever vision comes it does not make any differ, and say. All come from the natural state and so come to the practitioner. Generally normal daily visions are impure whereas Togol visions are pure. But the important point about Togol visions is not whether they are pure or not, but that they can be clearly seen to have no inherent existence. If one has practiced enough to liberate one's obscura, since one will have pure visions, otherwise not. The vi sense come from the four lamps, but until one reaches the rainbow body, they are still mixed with obscurations. Both togol vision and everyday awareness come from the natural state. According to Zhang Zunimai, in the base of the natural state there is cell and unification. The cell is temporary and is the vision we have learned and understood in this text. It is called the sun. It is sometimes said that the awareness is the sun and the emptiness is the mother. 
If one perseveres in the practice, one day the unification will be stable and for a moment it will be near to the basic nature. But this is only temporary and limited. It is like sailing in the English Channel. However, if one practices to the end it is inseparable and goes back to the real nature. This is like sailing in the deep ocean. Whatever one if one understands that all the visions are self-originated then one will be liberated into the Dharmaka. Quote from the text of Molten Gold, all the visions of the three kayas spontaneously exist and whatever visions arise must be understood as dreams, illusions. When you realize this you realize that they are not inherent. Therefore you must leave all desire for them. Just leave everything as it is, whatever comes, good or bad. Remain stable in the natural unification, as stable as possible. This is very important. Whatever vision comes, do not notice it but remain stable in the unification. There is then no doubt you will be liberated into the Dharmaka. Now all the visions dissolve into the nature again. All the visions dissolve in eight different ways, but not one after another all are dissolved at once. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. The first vision of compassion is dissolved into compassion, as when the sun sets and all the rays go back together. There is no difference who is leading or led. The visions of light dissolve into the light in the same way as the rainbow is clear but there is no substantial material in it. In the third, the visions of the kayas, all the visions of forms are dissolved to the forms. They are dissolved externally, into the nature. So there will be clarity inside, like the image that is inside the vessel. The fourth of the visions of wisdom. The visions of wisdom are all dis, practices will develop and ultimately return to the change, less nature. This must be understood or it can be a source of kenf, sen. The real nature does not develop nor decrease, but the practice must develop. Simply hearing that the natural state exists is not enough, for even though some people realize it, they still circulate in samsara. There is no contradiction here. You can realize Buddhahood in a moment, yet it is said it can take a very long time. It depends on the viewpoint. Solve to wisdom and the sun goes to the mother's lap. In this way wellness is liberated into the basic nature. 14. The vision of unification dissolves to the unification, meaning that all visions dissolve into nature like water pouring into water. The sixth is the vision of unending liberation. It is dissolved like the sky is dissolved into sky and everything is in union ben, the natural state. The seventh is the impure visions. They are dissolved into the pure visions like tents collapsing when you cut the guy ropes that support them. Everything is let in comments that unification means two things are united awareness and emptiness. Awareness, the sun, is dissolved into emptiness, the mother. However, they have always been inseparable. But how can you say that awareness dissolves into nature if they've always been together? What does it mean that awareness dissolves into nature? You must understand that they've always been united. That is the D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N view. So this refers only to the practitioner who has started to realize. When a person enters the intermediate state, at the beginning there are no visions. Then one comes out of the state and the visions start. They are sounds, rays and lights and when the visions start the perception starts at the same time. The sounds, rays and lights are all seen as the objects with the perception as the subject. This first perception is called yid, consciousness. At that moment either one realizes that these objects come from one's nature and the visions are illusion, or one is deluded and sees them as inherently existent. In this second case the very subtle ignorance, called the born together ignorance arises, and it is the beginning of a new cycle of birth. But if one realizes that the visions are self-created, then that is the beginning of Ritpa and one is not led into samsara. In a little while one will dissolve into the natural state. So the unification of mother and son is the realization that the visions are self-created. Collapsed and you cannot see the tent in the same way everything enters light without any delusion. The pure visions are dissolved into purity, into the door of wisdom. It is like the snow lion who runs to the high mountain he is safe, because there is no doubt he will not come back. After all the eight visions dissolve all that is left is unification, stable and clear forever. Someone who real, is the nature and practice up to this point will achieve the place of the Dharmaka and will never return to samsara at all. It is important to see that the practice during the lifetime is preparation for realization in the Bada when these kinds of visions arise. If you have experienced all these visions you can realize them and remain in the natural state. 
The three teachings these visions come during the Bardo time. All their conclusions are sounds, rays and lights and this is like a receiver. If you have practiced TBGL visions then that is like a transmitter, so in this time when you have these visions you must remember the following three teachings. First, whatever vision comes everything is your own self-vision. Remember it without any doubt, like when the son sees his mother. Second, once you realize that the visions are all self-vision, from then on you will never ever be deluded or disturbed. Like a golden spoon you will never change. Third, once you keep the final stable unification your awareness never comes back to samsara. It is like a narrow shot by a hero. It goes always straight but never comes back. These are the three teachings. The three important teachings are taken from the DZ Do G C H E N Yang Tse R D Z Do G S Gen Yang R T S E. Quote from the DZ Do G C H E N Yang Tse. When he Lishu Tarang was teaching it to his consort, he said that the person who has been shown directly in this way during the life takes no more than the next bardo. The three matters will be receiving and three matters will be sent in. He or she realizes the three important teachings and finally will be liberated. The secondary causes that make for liberation, there are six kinds of secondary cause to remind you in the bardo. They are, when the vision starts you immediately realize that this is a vision. Once you remember that these are the bardo vision, this makes you remember your yidam. Then suddenly the visions will come as the yidam, and you can see the yidam. You realize that you are in the bardo, and you are reminded of your lama. Then he comes in front of you and he again teaches you about the bardo visions. You suddenly remember the teachings you have received. You remember your view. You remember to practice the natural state and you remain in it. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. Remember Lama, remember teaching, remember Yidam, remember view, remember emptiness, and remember practice. At this time the practitioner receives the six clairvoy and faculties. 1. The six sense organs become purified and 2. The intelligence is purified. Therefore all the thoughts and doubts are purified. 3. The wisdom is purified and so it is known when all beings are born and where they will be reborn, and, 4. The contemplation is purified so it is easy and stable. 5. All the obscurations are purified so the practitioner has achieved his or her own purpose. He or she can see all the six realms clearly and emanate to them and teach them according to their understanding. 6. All knowledge is purified and he or she can see all the Buddha's knowledge. Quote from the text of Molten Gold. All the sense organs and all the knowledge is pure, wisdom and contemplation are pure, all the obscurations are finished and all the knowledge is perfect. To achieve this stage takes three moments, the second stage takes five moments and the third takes twenty-one moments. This is the end of the Bardo teachings. Before we said that if you do not realize the visions in the first, second or third stage, but you finally realize them in that fourth stage, you will be born in the Magi, Kelly emanated realms and you will learn and practice these ROGCHE and there. Before all the visions came and you did not realize the 21 levels, you realized them only in the Bardo of existence, the fourth stage. It is like in a dream. If you remember now that all the visions must be the bardo, you will realize that you are in the bardo of existence. If you remember at this time and wish to be reborn in the magically emanated realms, then you will take the magical birth there, that is, birth not dependent on parents. Quote from the Golden Spoon. If you realize the upper bardo, bardo, and you practice there, you will liberate all the karmic traces that result in your birth in the realms of sentient beings and you will be reborn in a manakaya form. The realm in which you will be born is connected to you by prayer and dedication and at the end of that life you will achieve Buddhahood. Therefore if during this life you judge that you have not practiced enough to do this, you should practice Fawa. Fawa practice imagine the central channel running through your heart and through a hole in the crown of your head. Imagine the mind leaping through this hole like a shooting star. Remember the magically emanated realms and from N, bear your intention to be reborn there. Your mind is visualized as a letter R. Remember the chief Buddha of this realm and imagine that your mind is ejected like a shooting star and dissolves in his heart. If you wish to be born in the East, White, the chief is the self netted clear tonpak Buddha, and the realm the clear happiest. To the north, green, the realm is called perfection of good actions and the tonpak is called Lagard Shuk D-G-E-L-L-H-A-G-A-R-P-H-Y-U-G. To the west, red, the realm is called heap flowers and the tonpak is called jedragame joemi by brad dngos tried.
to the south. Blue, the realm is called excellent brilliant place and the tonpa is called Goridan Tratigia Baradon Grub. Fee, Nori the central realm is called perfection exists and the tonpa is called Okanadin, WDKARGNSDZIN, surrounding each Buddha are by his Avas and Atan, dance whom he is teaching. All the realms are made from precious jewels and there are birds and animals. Trees and clean waters and all kinds of fruits and jeweled clothes are there. Above these realms are the realms of the wrathful deities. If you are born there you will live there for 500 years, and after that you will not have bardo visions, but will achieve Buddhahood without doubt. The realms were originally connected with each person's own nature. They are the self-emanated realms. The beings who have not received these A-Do-G-C-H-E-N, but have practiced the Yundring Ben teachings, can be born there without any practice other than prayer, reference, yug and dedication to be reborn there. The rest of the beings are driven on by karmic causes and have peaceful, happy, sad and neutral feelings. They take various births and hear nothing and believe nothing. They are always circulating into the option of misery, and nothing can help them. What follows is the dedication to the benefit of all beings. My Place 29, Letton comments that Shata concludes with the poetic description of his hermitage in a juniper grove in the mountains, where he went after having abandoned the life of a monk is where all the Dakinas and Sid, Dars visit and it is called Swastika Mountain. It is wrapped with rainbows like tents in the summertime, in round, straight and semicircular shapes. Flowers of snow come raining during the winter. There are trees which take warmth from the top and damp from the roots and the center of the trunk is white. The bark is red and their leaves are green like turquoise, and they have golden fruits. When it rains they give a wonderful smell and there are many of them, heaped. Inside there is my hermitage. When the sun shines they look like ladies looking at me and I am very happy and warm. They look as if they are dancing in front of me and many birds are dancing and singing and looking at each other. And tens and twenties of serious practitioners are by the side. This teaching was written there on paper given to me by my students and copied from the original manuscript by my first student Shferab. This is the essence of all the D's A Do G C H E N Met, Eds. If you practice this there will be no doubt nor mistakes and you will not waste your life. Ken McWapendix 1 An eyewitness account of a rainbow body One of Sharp's Atashi Oilson's main students was called Selwang Imtsedi Bange and he passed away between 1969 and 1970 in a Chinese jail. This was in Yang in Kem. It is not known what became of him. Four young monks went from Kung to see him before he was arrested and they received all the teach, ins of Dze Do Gchen from him including all of Shabza's works with all the initiations. They were there a long time. These monks were named Sultrim Tarchin, T-S-H-U-L-K-H-R-I-M-S Thfing, Tsewan Dechen Nienpo, T-S-H-E-D-V-A-N-G-D Jen Sniienpo, Tusapueza, G-T-S-U-D-P-H-U-D-F-Z-E, and Somnam Kelsam, B-S-O-N-M Sol Sengs. They were with him for nine years, but in 1958 Nienz, when the Chinese started to govern Tibet directly, they came back to Kungp. The first monk, Tsaltrim, was lost in the chaos of 1969. The second, Tsewam, was hidden by the villagers during the Cultural Revolution in 1969-70, but he was not well and died while in hiding. His body shrank over a 10-day period and was hidden afterwards in a basin. It was the size of a 10-inch plate. Nate Jampa hiding it had been a considerable danger to the Ville, Lagas but it was displayed in 1984, for at the time the Chinese lifted restrictions on the practice of religion. The third student, Tusapueza, died in 1983. After seven days his body also shrunk to a small size but did not get any smaller. This was kept for two months along with Tsao Wang's body. Both these bodies were cremated together in a large ceremony. The cremations were attended by two monks, Yesheza, Yeshezobza, and Ang Yenlam, Sengs Rgyas Menlam, who live in Kathmandu with Lepantenium Namdik. At least 10,000 people gathered to witness these cremations. Yesh saw both bodies close up. They were nearly naked sitting in full lotus posture. The bodies were very light, perfect but just small, as everything had shrunk at the same rate. Indeed both monks were in the village when Tosapueza died, and witnessed many other stand manifestations, such as rainbows spreading along the ground even though there was a clear sky. 
This was even more surprising as Tusapueza was not thought to be much of a practitioner because he drank Chang. Another student of Sharpsa called Tosan Drinposh, B-R-T-S-O-N Grus Rinpoche, passed away in 1985 in the Bonpo Center at Delanji. Everybody living there saw rainbows, straight as well as round, some white and some five kernel, Lord. They appeared out of the clear sky as he died. Even when it was nearly dark there were white rainbows glowing in the sky. This was seen by many many people in Delanji. After he was cremated many people searched in the ashes for relics. The officiating monks found many big relic pills. Others were seen but when people tried to pick them up they could not catch them they seemed to disappear. The pills are kept by the abbot in Delanji. Tom Pasha in Rub Appendix 2 A Short History F and 1 The origin of Bio and the Bonpos maintain that Ben originated in the land of Omo Lundring Elmo Lundring, a part of a larger country called Tezib, R-T-A-G-G-Z-I-G-S. 01 symbolizes the Un, born, Mo the undiminishing. Lung the prophetic words of Tom Pasha Himru, Stom Pajeshen Rap, the founder of Ben, and ring his everlasting compassion. Omo Lundgring constitutes one third of the existing world and is situ, ed to the west of Tibet. It is described as an eight, petaled lotus under a sky which appears like an eight, spoked wheel. In the center rises Mount Yundrungutsk, Undrung Dgubrtsegs Pyramid of Nine Swas, Tykas. The swastika is the symbol of permanence and indestructibility. The nine swastikas, piled up represent the nine ways of Ben. At the base of Mount Yundrung spring four rivers, flowing toward the four cardinal directions. The mountain is surrounded by temples, cities extracted from the pamphlet Tibet Moondrung Ben Monastery in India, published by the Yundrung Ben Monastic Center, Salon, 1983, translated by Tadjus Skorupski. And Parks. To the south is the palace Begbasoki Bar Poso Brgyad, where Tom Pashahinrub was born. To the west and north are the palaces in which lived the wives and children of Tom Pashahinrub. A temple named Shampu Lhatse, Shampu Lhatse, is to the east. The complex of palaces, rivers and parks with Mount Yundrung in the center constitutes the inner region, Nangling, Nangling, of Omo Lungring. The intermediate region, Belling. Bardalin consists of 12 cities, four of which are toward the cardinal directions. The third region includes the outer land, Telling, M-T-H-A apostrophe G-L-I-N-G. These three regions are encircled by an ocean and again by a range of snowy mountains. The access to Omo Lungring is gained by the so-called Aero Way, Delam, M-D-A Lam. Before his visit to Tibet, Ton Pashahinrib shot an arrow, thus creating a passage through the mountain range. This very sophisticated description of Omo Lung Ring has been tentatively related by some scholars to different geographical locations. Some see it as a D description of Mount Kailash, 77 SE, and the four great rivers that spring from its base China being the land to the east, India to the south, or Jian to the west and Cotton to the north. To other scholars the description seems to resemble that geography of the Middle East and Persia in the time of Cyrus the Great. To a believing Bonpo the question of the geographic identification of Omo Lundgren does not come so much to the fore, ground as does its symbology, which is clearly made use of to indicate the spram and an origin of his religion. Symbolic descriptions, which combine history, jagra, phi and mythology, are well-known phenomena in, in scriptures. The description of the universe with Mount Mera supporting the sky and the four chief continents to the four cardinal points and this earth as the southern continent, Jinbugvipa, is another similar example. The founder and his teachings The founder of Ben religion is the Lord Shehin Radmua, G-S-H-E-N Rabmibo. In past ages there were three brothers, Dukpa Dukpa, Selwa, G-S-A-L Baya, and Shepaspa, who studied the Ben doctrines in the heaven named Iga Yesangs Ripavesangs, under the Ben Sage Bumtrologi Chechim Bun Khrigologiiscan. When their studies were completed, they visited the God of Compassion, Shen Laoka G-S-H-E-N slash Hadet D-K-A-R, and asked him how they could help the living beings submerged in the misery and sorrow of suffering. He advised them to act as guides to humankind in three successive ages of the world. To follow his advice the eldest brother, Dukpa, completed his work in the past world age. The second brother, Selwa, took the name Shehimru and became the teacher and guide of the present world age. 
the young, s brother, Shaper, will come to teach in the next world age. The Lord Shehinrab was born in the Bebasoki Pal, ace to the south of Mount Yungdrin. He was born a prince, married while young and had children. At the age of 31 he renounced the world and lived in austerity, teaching the doctrine. During his whole life his efforts to propagate the Ben religion were obstructed by the demon Kiyad Palagring Khvir Palagring. This demon fought to destroy or impede the work of Tom Pashahinrab until he was eventually converted. Once, pursuing the demon to regain his stolen horses, Tom Pashahinrab arrived in Tibet. It was his only visit to Tibet. There he imparted some instructions concerning the performance of rituals but, on the whole, found the land unprepared to receive fuller teachings. Before leaving Tibet he prophesied that all his teachings would flower, ish in Tibet when the time was ripe. Tom Pashahinrab departed this life at the age of 82. There are three written accounts of Tom Pashahinrab. The earliest and shortest one is known as Dead, M.D.O.D.O.S. Epitome of Aphorism the second, which is in two volumes, is called Zermid, G.Z.E.R.M.I.G. Piercing I. These two accounts date from the 10th and 11th centuries respectively. The third and largest is in 12 volumes and is known by its shortened title, Zhaiji, G.Z.H.I. Bridget the Glorious who belongs to the category of Scrib, Juries known as Spiritual Transmission B.S.N.Y.A.N.R.G.Y.U.D. It is believed to have been dictated to Longda Nyingpo by Oidans Nyingpo, who lived in the 14th century. The doctrines which were taught by Lord Shehinrab and recorded in these three accounts are divided into two systems. One classification is called Gorge Dzdonga, Sgobzhimdzdodinga, that four portals and the treasury as fifties are Shabka, Shabdi Kar, White Waters contains the esoteric or higher tantric practices. Shabnik Shatni, Black Waters, includes Naya, relatives and various rites, magic and ordinary ritual, else such as death, funeral, illness and ransom rituals. Panul Fanul, the land of Pan, explains the monastic rules and gives exposition of philosophical concepts. Pons Dpongsas, the lordly guide, contains the great perfection practices, DZOGCHEN, RDZOGSCHEN, TOTOGAM THO TOHOG, the treasury, it comprises the essential aspects of all the four portals. The second classification is called Parim Gibbenther Parim DGU apostrophe I Ben the Ben of the nine successive stages, or simply the nine ways of Ben the first four are the cause, EIT PAN. RGYUYI Therpa, the next four are the ways of result, Drabhutapa, Brasbu Therpa, and the ninth is the Great Perfection, DZOGCHEN, RDZOGSCHEN. Examined individually, their subject matter is as follows The Way of the Shen of Prediction, Khashantapa, FIWGSHEN Therpa, describes four differ, end ways of prediction, Sortage, Mo, Mo, Astrology, Tissi. RTSIS, Ritual, 2, GTO, and Examine A, 2 and of Causes, CHE, DPYAD. The Way of the Shen of the Visual World, NEN, SHEN TAPAN, SNING SHEN THERPAN, explains the airy, jinn and nature of gods and demons living in this world, the methods of exorcism and ransoms of various kinds. The Way of the Shen of Illusion, TROL SHEN TAPAN, FROL SHEN THERPAN, contains the rights for the disposing of adverse powers. The way of the chain of existence, Sishan Tapan, Zrishan Therpan, concerns the state after death, Bardo, and methods of guiding living beings to, what the final liberation or a better rebirth. The way of the virtuous followers, Genium Tapan, DGEBSNYEN Therpan, guides those who have fell, low the ten virtues and ten perfections. The way of the monk out, Drangsan Tapan, Drangsran Therpan, describes the rules of monas, tip discipline. The way of pure sound, Akutapan, a DKAR Therapa, gives an exposition of higher tantric practices, the theory of realization through the Mis, Tip Circle, Mandela, and the rituals which form an integral part of these practices. The way of primeval Shen, Yeshen Tapan, Yegshen Therapa, stresses the need for a suitable master, place and occasion for tantric practices. Here the layout of the mystic circle is described in detail together with instructions from Ditta, Tiwan on particular deities. The Supreme Way, Blame Tapan, Blamit Therapa, the highest attainment of the Great Perfection, Ardizadogs Chen. 
the preoccupation of the Oen and Zhangzhong and Tibet the first pen scriptures were brought to Zhangzhong by six disciples of Macho Demtrug, Mu Koro Demtrug, the successor of Tom Pachatanrib. They were first translated into Zhangzhong language and later into Tibetan. The works included in the Bonpur canon as we know it now are written in Tibetan language, but a number of them, especially the older ones, retain the titles and at times hold passages in the Zhangzhong language. Until the 7th century, Zhangzhong existed as a separate state which comprised the land to the west of the central Tibetan provinces of Yu, Dbus, and Tsang, Gtsang, generally known now as Western Tibet. The historical evidence is incomplete but there are some reliable indications that it may have extended over the vast area from Ilet in the west to the lake of Nemtsen Mtsho, in the east, and from Cotton in the north to Mustang in the south. The capital of Zhangzhong was a place called Kungung Ngulkhar, Kunlung Dngul March the Silver Palace of the Gerida Valley, the ruins of which are to be found in the upper Sluj Valley to the southwest of Mount Kailash. The people of Zhangzhong spoke a language which is classified among the Tibeta, Burmese group of Sino-Tibetan languages. The country seems to have been ruled by a dynasty of kings which ended in the 8th century when the last king, Likmaria, Likmihaya or Likmria, was assassinated by King Songsten Gampo and Zhangzhong became an integral part of Tibet. Since the annexation, Zhangzhong became gradually Tibetanized and its language, culture and many beliefs were integrated into the general frame of Tibetan culture. Through Zhangzhong, which was geographically situated near the great cultural centers of Central Asia such as Ilit and Cotton, many religious and philosophical concepts infiltrated Tibet. With the increasing interest in Buddhist religion, the founding of Emi Bsam Yas Monastery in 779 CE, and the establishment of Buddhism as the principal religion, the Ben religion was generally discouraged and serious attempts were made to eradicate it. However, the adherence of Ben among the nobility and especially among the common people, who for generations had followed the Ben beliefs, retained their religious Kenvik, Tins and Ben survived. During the 7th and 8th centuries, which were particularly difficult times, many Bonpo priests fled central Tibet, having first concealed their scriptures for fear of their destruction and to preserve them for future generations. Drenpa Nimka, Drenpa Nmkha apostrophe, one of the greatest Bonpo personalities of the time, embraced Buddhist religion out of fear of being killed and for the sake of preserving in secret the Bonpo teachings. From the 8th to the 11th centuries we know practically nothing of the developments among the Ben, Pose. The revival of Ben began with the discovery of a number of important texts by Shenchen Guya, GSHE and Chen Lu DGA backslash 9, 6, 9, 1, 0, 3, 5, in the year 1017 CE. With him the Ben religion emerged as a fully systematized religious system. Shenchen Guya was born in a clan of Shen, which is descended from Kong Chuangtum Kong Tshadbang slash Dan, one of the sons of Tom Pashatanrib. The descendants of this important Bonpo family still live in Tibet. Shenchen Guya had a large following. To three of his disciples he entrusted the task of continuing three diff, French traditions. To the first one, Drukhan Namkai Yundran, Burich Nmmkha apostrophe Yundran, who was born in a clan of Duri which migrated to Tibet from Russia, Burich is the Tibetan name for Ilit, he entrusted the studies of cosmology, DZOPU. MDZODPHUG, and metaphysics, Gapa, Gepa. Namka Yundrung's disciple founded the monastery of Yuru Wenzaka, Yesro and Saka, in 1072. This monastery remained a great center of learning until 1386 when it was badly damaged by floods and later on was abandoned. With the decline of Yuru Wenzaka, the Dura family continued to sponsor the Ben religion, but it came to extinction in the 19th century when, for the second time, a reincarnation of the Panchen Lama was found in this family. The first reincarnation was the second Panchen Lama, B1663, and the second the fifth Panchen Lama, B1854. The second disciple, Zhuil Perjulius Lxpa, was assigned to maintain the DZOGCHEN teachings and practice. He founded the monastery of Gyakarazing, Skydem Khaarazing. The descendants of the Zhu family now live in India. The third disciple, Patwan Pathok Spast and Dpal Metho, took responsibility for upholding the Tantric teachings. The members of the Pa family moved from Zantakem where they still live. 
Mook Papalkin, R M U M K H A S P A D P A L Chert, B. 1052, who came from the Metlan, founded the Zangri, Zainri, monastery, which also became a center for philosophical studies. Thus during the period from the Lev, end to the 14th centuries the Bibi apostrophe NPOS had four important centers of studies, all of which were in Zan province. At the beginning of the 15th century, the religious studies were strengthened by the founding of Nre Monastery in 1405 by the great Bonpo teacher, Nyem Shvera Boyeltsen, Mnyam Mitshez Rabaji Yalmtshan, 1356-1415. Nre Monastery and the two mentioned below remained the most important centers of studies until the Chinese takeover of Tibet in 1959. The Monastery of Yundring Lin was founded in 1834 and, soon afterwards, the Monastery of Karna, M-K-H-A-R-S-N-A, both in the vicinity of Nre. With these monasteries as centers of study and religious inspiration, many monasteries were established throughout the whole of Tibet, except the central Prev, Inns of Yu, especially in Khump, Kem, Amda, Yia, Reng and Hoya. By the beginning of the 20th century, there were 330 Bonpo monasteries in Tibet. Appendix 3 Biography F. Lagbantenium Nedit Lagbantenium Nedit Slop D. P. O. N. B. S. T. A. N. D. Z. I. N. Mandeg was born in 1926 in Khump Karakhump D. K. A. R. U. in Khem province of eastern Tibet. At the age of 7, 1933, he entered Tinchin Monastery, Stenchari, in the same district and in 1941, traveled to Yundrung Lin, Undrung Lin, one of the two leading Bonpu monasteries in central Tibet. Coming from a family far, mess for its artists, he was largely engaged here in helping to execute a series of wall paintings in the new temple of this monastery. In 1944 he went on pilgrimage to Nepal, including Seluk Humba, Kathmandu, Pokhara, and Mustang. In 1945 he returned to Yundrung Lin to begin his studies in philosophy, Tsenye, MTSHA and Yud. From 1945 to 1950 he lived more or less a hermit's existence with his tutor and master Gangrering Posh, S-G-A-N-G Ruti S-H-U-L-K-H-R-I-M-S-R-G-Y-A-L-M-T-S-H-A-N, under whom he studied grammar, da, S-G-R-A, poetics, Nyanga, Sneon and G-A-G, monastic discipline, Dula, Dlufra, cosmology, D-Z-O-P-U. MDZODPHUG, and the stages of the path to enlightenment, Salam, Salam. Following his master's advice, in 1950 he went to Mre Monastery, as Mati Re, literally the medicine mountain, in Zan province in central Tibet, in order to complete his Nyem Shvera Boyeltsen studies in preparation for the Shell DGEBSHES degree examination, the Tibetan equivalent to a Doctor of Philosophy. In 1953 he obtained this degree from Nunray. From 1953 until 1957 he was the teaching master or professor, Slop Dpon, at Nunray. He retired from this posy, Tiwan in 1957 as conflict between the native Tibetans and the encroaching Chinese communists increased in central Tibet. Until 1960 he remained in retreat at Zig Monastery on the Danga Lake in northern Zang. After the March 10, 1959 Lhasi uprising against the Khem, Nis Chinese, many of the most famous lamas of Tibet, including the Dalai Lama and the Yolwa Kamwa, were forced to flee their homeland. Following them, a flood of Tibetan refugees entered India and Nepal. In 1960 Lepan Ringposh also sought to flee to India, but he was shot and wounded on the way by Chinese Sol, Desand was incarcerated in a Chinese prison for 10 months. Finally he was able to make an escape and find his way to safety in Nepal, by way of the small principality of Mustang. In 1961, while in Kathmandu, Lepin Rinpoche met and was befriended by the celebrated English Tibetologist David Snellgrove, who invited him to come to London. Thus Lepin came to serve as a visiting scholar at the University of London, and under a Rockefeller Foundation, Tipton Grant he resided for a time at Cambridge University. A collaboration with Professor Snellgrove resulted in the publication of An Inge Ways of Ben, London, Oxford University Press, 1967, which contains translated ex tracts from the famous Zhijiji Zibrjtd, the most extensive hagiography of the book of Tom Pashahanrib. This was the first scholarly study of the Bonpo tradition to be made in the West.
Letton and Posh remained in England for three years, 1961 to 1964. He made a second visit to Europe in 1969, when at the invitation of Professor Helmut Hoffmann, he was a visiting scholar at Munich University, contributing to the monumental Tibetan Re Man English Dictionary being compiled there. Among the nearly 100,000 Tibetan refugees who had fled the Chinese occupation of Tibet, a number belonged to the Bonpo tradition. Escaping from Zan province, the monks of Mre Monastery, which had been totally destroyed by the communists, found themselves in the Kulumandi district of High, Mekhail Pradesh state in northwestern India. In Pother, Isht, they were forced to secure a livelihood as road workers. Among their number was Shveropladro, the 32nd abbot of Mre, 1935-1963. Finding the roadwork hard and exhausting, many of the monks died or suffered from serious illness. Lieutenant Nimbug consequently undertook the task of raising funds and finding land in order to establish a Bonpur settlement in India. With the financial help of the Catholic Relief Service, he purchased a piece of undeveloped forest land at Delange, near Selan in High, Mekhail Pradesh. In 1967 a settlement was formally established and registered with the Indian government under the name of the Tibetan Bonpur Foundation. About 70 families transferred there from Menli and each received a house and a small piece of land, the size depending on the number of people in the family in question. The Tibetan Bonpur Foundation possessed its own constitution and administration, with the abbot of Nray acting as president. The new settlement at Delange was named Tohobgilsa Erpa, Tohobgilsa after the village Tohobgil in Zam province which was located near Mnre Monastery. Most of the Tibetans in the new settlement came from the MT. Kailash region and Upper Zang in the west, and from Hoya, Kongpa, Deg, Amda and Gyanyi in the east of Tibet. After the death in 1963 of the abbot of Mnre, Shveropladro, the abbot of Yundran Lin, became the Spiri, tool head of the Bonpo community in exile. He came to Delanger with a group of monks and founded a new monastic community, overseeing the erection of some small houses and a small prayer chapel. In 1969 the successor to the deceased abbot of Mnre was chosen by lot. The offers fell to Lung Tok Tenpe Niemar in Posh Lung Arti Ogs Pstanpa Apostrophe I Niemar in Pache, who thus became the 33rd abbot of Mnre. Following the death of the Yundringling abbot, Ang Yutenin assumed the spiritual leadership of the Bonpos in exile. More houses were erected, as well as a library and an abbot's rosary, dens, labran, blabrang. Monastic life was organized around the ordinances of the Vinya, Tula, Du slash Bao. The foundation for a main temple was laid in 1969 and completed in 1978. It was given the name of Paushan Tenre Lin, D-P-A-L-G-S-H-E-N-B-S-T-A-N Smart Rudlin. The whole complex was designated as the Bonpur Monastic Center and formed part of the Tibetan Bonpur Foundation. From 1970 to 1979 Letton Rinpoche continued teach, in and writing while residing at the Bonpur Monastic Center, and, in addition, he was much engaged in the publishing in New Delhi of a large number of important Bonpur texts. From the time the first monks came to Delanji in 1967, the teaching had been done by Lepnang Yutenin, the former head teaching master at Mnre, assisted by his successor, Lepnang Nimdug, himself the founder of the settlement at Delanji. When Ang died in 1968, Lepnang Nimdug was assigned the full responsibility for the education of the younger generation of monks. By 1978 a sufficient number of Bonpur texts had been published so that classes could be organized around them in a curriculum. Thus Alamas College, Shadrup, B.S.H.A.D.S.G.R.U.B., was established in 1978, organized under the guidance of Flodden Ringposh, who served as one of the two professors at the college. The official name of the college is Yundrang Ben Shadrup Lepin Yudud, Yundrang Ben B.S.H.A.D.S.G.R.U.B. Slotn Yudus S.D.E. The purpose of the new Lama's College of Delange was to preserve the tradition of philosophy established and developed at Uruwenzaka, Yesrotibe and Saukar, where philosophical analysis and logic were applied to the understanding of Duengams, Mdos and Gagsms Gsum, that is, to the teachings of the Stres, the Tantras and Ize Do Gchen. Unlike the Nyingmapa tradition, the Bonpos developed a system of logic and debate specifically relating to the Dze Do Gchen teaching. 
at Nredi in Tibet, the monks studied the five scripture systems, Dorj Hun Nga, Mdog Zebdhu Ng Inga, in the philosophy college, but all instruction in Tantra and Zedog Chen was done in private. The five scriptures, actually five collections of texts, are Sema, Tshad Ma, Praminologic, Parching Fing, Prajna Paramita or the Perfection of Wisdom Stres, Uma, Dbu Ma, Madhya Marka Philosophy, Dzodpu, Mdzod Fug, Abhidham or Cosmology, and Duladu slash Baya, Vinya or Monastic Discipline. However, at the revived Nreya Delange, students also studied Tantra and Dzodoji Chen in the college, as well as the above five scriptural systems which pertain to the Sutra level of teaching. Also included in the course of studies are the secular sciences, Rikne, Rignash, such as Gram, March, Poetics, Astrology, and so on. The college has a nine-year program of studies which prepares the student for the Shetagri examination. The first group of young monks completed the course in 1986. Recently another Bonpu monastery and college has been established under Lepantenian Edic's direction in Nepal. Known as Triton or Buttes, K-H-R-I-B-R-T-A and Orburais, it is located near the famous hill of Swayambu, west of Kathmandu. In 1989, Lepantenian Edic made his third visit to the west, this time to England, America and Italy at the invitation of the Dzadoji Chen communities in those countries. During the course of a six-month slep and ring, Posh presented to interested Western students the Dzadoji Chen teachings according to the Bonpo traditions of the Atria, a Khrid, and the Zanjuni Nayu, Zanjumsni and Rgyud. Also, in the beginning of 1991, he visited Germany, England, Holland and Italy. During his visit to these countries, he gave discourses and teachings on various meditation systems and fields of study of the Bentredi, Tin. Later that year he was invited by His Holiness the Dalai Lama to represent the Bent tradition at the Kala, Kekra initiation in New York. In this way, Lepin Ring, Posh has been spreading the VBMPO teachings in many countries. His permanent residence is lying Kathmandu, Nepal, and Delanji, India. Illustrations Epa Yelmak over the central figure is Epa Yamo, Zripa Gya slash Mo, a guardian deity with three heads and six arms who rides on a black mule. She is shown surrounded by flames on a lake of blood that is encircled by snakes moving through rugs. She carries swords, dagger, mirror, skull cup and hook. There exist four emanations of Epa Yalmo. The peaceful rides a white mule. She has four heads and eight hands. The extended Epa Yalmo rides on a blue mule. The subdued Epa Yalmo rides on a red mule and the wrathful Epa Yalmo rides on a black mule. Here, the central figure shows the wrathful form. To the left is the subdued form on a red mule. To the right is an emanation of Epa Yalmo called Midrama, Mitrema, riding on the yak. She is the particular protector of a cycle of Dzadoji Chen and teachings called Selwangbo Yulma, T-S-H-E-D-B-A-N-G Bod Yulma. In front of Ipa Yamo is Nyem Shvera Boyeltsen, Mnyam Mitshez Rabaji Yalmtshan, the founder of Nre Monastery. In general Ipa Yamo is a protector of all Yundring Ben teachings and of this text. This tanker is newly drawn by Tezu in Yangpel, Tshe Ring Yamfil, who is the first cousin of Lepantenium Nemdug and is considered to be the foremost tanker painter still living in Tibet. Ton Patrick Skjol with Rantis Peace Ton Patrick Skjol were, Sten Pa Khrigtsugrgyal Bayer, is Ton Pashahin Rub in the form of a monk after his ordination of the age of 32. Drawing by Dezu in Yangpel. Shadza Tashi Oilson Puj 16 here Shadza is shown in his ordinary form. Above the central figure to the viewers left is Shadza's Yidam, Purbadrugs Khempa, Fapa Brut Gsas Chemical Pa. At the top center is the Dahamakaya Buddha Kuntus Angpa, who represents the nature of Shabza's achievement, his three kayas, bodies. At the top right is the emanation of the Siddhapsal Wang Ridding, Tsetibang Rik Dzadayan, the twin brother of Guru Ring Posh, son of Zangjum Drenpa Namka, Zangjum Drenpa Namka, and the Indian Brahmin girl of Nbama Ogit Nbama, according to the Ben tradition. At the bottom left is Shabza's form as a tantric practitioner. The bottom center figure is the particular guardian for the Dzadoji Chen lineage and practitioners, Yeshwalmo, Yeshaz Dbalmo. 
At bottom right is Shasta's form as a DZOGCHEN practitioner, in the style of a yogi. Surrounding Shasta are many animals, signifying his compassion towards all beings. This image was made in Shasta's monastery of Shasta Retro, Shasta Rickford, in Dij. Yoli Yom Shverab Jama, page 34. This is the mother of all Buddhas, Yoli Yom Shverab Jama, RGYAYUM Shaz Rap Biams Ma, whose name translates as love, in Goddess of Wisdom. The figures surrounding Yoli Yom Shverab Jama show the six Nara, Naya, which have the function of subduing to stir, fences. There is a Gerida at the top. The upper pair of Naya, half human, half bird. The middle pair ride on the mythological animals called Shayarana, and the lower pair ride on elephants. Drawing by Tenim Namdik. Drenpanam Kapaj 50 here Drenpanam Ka, Drangpan MMKH apostrophe A, appears in the form of an early Siddha of Ben. This was drawn by Tezza in Yangpel. Tutki Troat Osa Koke Ging Patch 76 Another of the five essential yidams of Ben, Thugs Kir Khro Boji Tso Makhokm Ka Ying's three heads and six arms and stands in union with his consort. He presses down the male and female forms representing ignorance and desire and stands in a flaming fire. In front of him there is an offering in a skull of the five sense organs eyes, ears, tongue, nose and skin. In general he represents the mind of the Buddha. This image was copied by Tenim Nedek from the original, drawn by his great-grandfather. Purbadrugsk Hempa, page 78, the uppermost image is a peaceful form of Purbadrugsk Hempa, Fuhrpurbrugsk Hempa, called Mpan Yingchen Ma Pan Dbyimgs Chen, with consort. He has three heads and six arms, and sits on a lotus cushion. Beneath is the image of Troadrugsk Hempa, Khrowo Brugsus Chemical Pa, with three heads and six arms in union with a consort, flying on a Gerida. The main image is of Purbadrugsk Hempa. The upper part of the body is a rodful deity with three heads and six arms in union with consort. The lower part of the body be, comes a three-bladed dagger, Fyrpa. This dagger emerges from the head of a crocodile-like mythological animal. It is decorated with snakes and human heads and entrails. Beside the dagger Purba emanates two attendants. On the deity's right side is a human with the head of a mecha riding on a mecha. On his left side is a human with a boar's head riding on a boar. The dagger impaled two figures, male and female, representing ignorance and desire. The image has three main parts which represent the peace, full, wrathful and extremely wrathful aspects of this deity. Purba is one of the five essential yidams of the Bonpo and represents the activity of the Buddha. Drawing by Tenim Namlik. Magyu page 116 The main figure of Magyu, Maya Gyud, has seven heads, sixteen hands and eight legs. The right hands hold skull cups filled with the hearts of the gods. The left hands hold the blood of the eight classes of beings. Magyu is shown in union with his consort, Kima Watts, Kima Ebncho. Beneath his feet are the eight different objects of desire, the Elshas. He stands on a lotus on a throne supported by snow lions representing anger. Above him is the peaceful form of Magyu called Keng, Ying Karpo, MKH apostrophe A Ingrupa. He has four hands and sits in the lotus posture on a lotus cushion. Surrounding Magyu are the four Dakinas representing the qualities of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity and happiness. They have four heads and eight arms. Then there are eight more Dakinas. Four of them have three heads and eight arms as wrathful forms and the other four have two heads and four arms as peaceful forms. They represent further qualities. Below the throne are sixteen Okfras offering the two cycles of Magyu and other objects. Altogether the complete cycle of Magyu has five tankers, representing the base, the path and the fruit of this tantra. This image represents the fruit aspect. This figure comes from the Gyaong Trokan, RGYA Rank KHRO Chen, Palace. It was carved of wood, but was entirely destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. Ken Migwa 134 The Protector Ken Migwa GCANLHA Mid has three heads, to the right of the central head is a crow's head and to the left of the central head is a boar's head. Ken Migwa has eight arms and stands on a nine-headed boar. He is the particular guardian of the Nemgil, Mamar GYA slash, cycle emanated by Tom Pashen, Rab. He is also in general a protector of Yundrin Ben. This image was recopied by Tenim Nedek from the original, drawn by his great-grandfather. 
Nate Jampak page 136 This image shows Nate Jampak, Nate by Ampar, the important protector of the wealth, DBALGSAS, cycle and later the protector of Nyem Shfera Boyeltsen, MNYTN Mitchell Rabaji YALMTSHAN, who is the founder of Nre Monastery. The protector rides on an altar and carries an obscene his right hand and aspirant black flag in his left dot his function is to protect the bond point the purity of the teachings and to give assistance to serious practitioners. Drawing by Tenim Namlik. Ton Pashahin Rupaj 138 This is an image of Ton Pashahin Rupaj Ton Pashahin Rupaj when he was king of the central part of Omo Lungring. This form shows him after his coronation but before the age of 32 when he took Vinaya vows. Drawing by Tenim Nemlik. Nyem Shfera Boyelson page 148 Nyem Shfera Boyelson MNJ Amit Shaz Rabaji J Al MTSHATI was the founder of Nre Monastery in Tibet. He was the 19th abbot of the monastery of Wenzaka DBENSA which was founded in the 10th century. After it was destroyed by flood, the monastery was moved higher into the mountains and renamed Nre. This was drawn by Lepin Tenim Nemlik himself. The well situated swastika chalk temperage 164 the Yundrin collect Jordan, GVUNGDRUNGBSKOD legs Mikadatien, is a very popular image for the Bontwa. It is one of the 360 chalk and described in the Zijid, GZI Brigid, the biography of Tom Pashahinrib. Only 120 of these can be made as the others are all chalk of emptiness and awareness and are not physical. The structure of the Chalkton represents all the teachings of Sutra, Tantra and Izado Gchen. From the perspective of Sutra, at the bottom the five steps represent the five elements of the realms of sentient beings. The square pedestal represents the four kindnesses of the Buddhas. The decorated beam represents the guardians between Samsara and Nirvana and the upper four steps represent the four kindnesses of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity and happiness. The vase represents the nature of the Buddha. The absence of corners shows the nature of equanimity. Above this there are 13 steps that show the complete knowledge of the bud. Ah. As an aspect of the path these are known as the 13 BHUMIS. The umbrella is protection from the elements of fire, wind and rain and shows the kindness of the Buddhas in protecting all sentient beings. At the very top there is a tegel that shows that everything returns to the natural state. The two horns represent the two truths, Taz and Shazra, method and wisdom. The flaming sword shows that all the passions are destroyed by this knowledge. This style of Chalkton is unique to the Yundring Ben and is distinct from the Buddhist style. Drawing by Tenim Namlik. Bibliographic essay by Pukavarani the DZO GCHEN of Ben is dealt with in a very limited number of publications. The most extensive treatment is probably my own study of the Atria of KHRID tradition which goes back to Megonzo Retro Kemper, RMEUDGONGSMDZODRIKHRODCHENPO 1038-1096, in which I have translated several short biographies and a substantial part of a basic text by Gonzo himself, Bonpo Stud, this. The 8 KHRID system of meditation, Kalish 1, 1, 1973, 1950, 1, 4, 1973, 247 to 332. A short summary of the entire text is to be found in my The Great Prefk, to and in the tradition of the Bond Pros, in L. Lancaster and W. Lai, Eds. Erlich and Inch C. Heiner and Tibet. Barclay Buddhist Studies 5, Barclay, 1983, 367-392. A short extract from a longer text was published by David Snell, Grove in his The Nine Ways of Ben, London Oriental Series 18, London, 1967, 226-255. Turning to the Buddhist variety of Dzedo Gchen, there is a somewhat larger range of literature. Of Prime Impa, Tenser Sempton Oilson Kame's study, The Great Perfection. AP Philosophical and Meditative Teaching of D. Beden Buddhism, Lighten, Brill, 1988. This study Kenson treads on the early, formative centuries of the Buddhist Dzedo Gchen tradition, and only devotes a few pages 
2018-0-2-0-1-2-0-5, to DZ Do G C H E N in Ben. Kame's book is indispensable to anyone who has a serious interest in DZ Do G C H E N. Kame has also published several articles. The reader is referred to his book for further references. For those who read German, a useful and interesting book is Franz Karl Erhard, Fulgelschuldschgarde. Litera, und die Dienergesicht, Leichheit Makungen zu einer Liedersammlung zur die OGS Chen, T, Betten und Indotir Betten Studies 3, Stuttgart, Franz Steiner, 1990. This is a translation and detailed study of a kernel, collection of spiritual songs by the DZ Do GCHE and Master Shahab, Katsokdruk Rangrol, Zahis DKARTSHOGS Drug Rangrol 1781-1851. An important introduction to the doctrine and ritual of DZ Do GCHEN has been included by Peter Schwieger in his catalogue of the textual cycle of Kung Tu Sang Pagong Per Central, Kung Tu BZ Dang POVDGONGS Parzain Vit to Bish Hanschrift and Block Till 9, Stuttgart, Franz Steiner, 1985, especially pages.lxvlxxxiv. A book which contains translations of several DZ Do G Chen texts from the Buddhist as well as the Bonpo traditions is Jaya Kamalorafino, Sacred Tibetan Teachings on Death and Liberation, Bridport, Prison Press, 1990, Italian edition, Insgnameni Tibetani Su Morte Librazioni, Rome, 1985. Orofino's book has a brief but useful introduction. One of the most important Tibetan scholars and spiritual masters of the Nyingma Dze Do GCHEN tradition is Longchen Rab Jampa, Klongchen Rab Biams Pa 1308134. A major work of his dealing with Dze Do GCHEN is NGLSO Kerismen GALGSO Skorik Sunny, which has been translated in three volumes by Herbert V. Kuntha has kindly been to ease us, M. Rival, about. Dharma Publishing, 1975-76. Gunther's erudition and complete mastery of the text are beyond dispute. His hermeneutical method, however, Ren, des his translations controversial. Another impressive study is his Matrix of Mystery. Scientific and humanistic aspects of RDZ Do GS Gen Thought, Boulder, 1984. Finally, the numerous publications by Nimkine Orb, himself an accomplished master of DZ Do GCHEN and a Lama with a large number of pupils in the West, must be mentioned. His works have an authenticity which can only be imparted by an experienced adept. A petaku, really interesting work, is his spiritual autobiography, ed, edited by J. Shen, The Crystal and the Way of Light, Sutra, Tantra, and Dokchen, New York, 1986.